Hi. Uh, yeah, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining this uh, GBB buff session. Uh, I, so can I just uh, get a confirmation that the sound is fine? Everybody hears me? Maybe in the chat or something like that. <laughs> I see people typing, so I guess that's good. Uh, so, and maybe one mention is, uh, and that I think that's valid for throughout the conference. Um, so it's a bit different to have, uh, yeah, my hello. It's a bit different to have this uh, online versus uh, in person. So, and especially for buffs, we want to have as many people participating, but it can be hard uh, when we do this online to, you know, to avoid speaking uh, everybody at the same time. So how, which, how we expect it to work is that if you want to kind of raise your hand, I think you can do that through the, uh, the system. You can click on your name, set status, and raise hand, but that's not very visible. So what we want to do instead is that if you want to take a turn of speaking, uh, you turn your camera on, and whoever is speaking should see you appear, and they know that that's like raising your hand. So if you want to say something, just turn your camera on. It takes a few seconds, but uh, I'll do. And yeah, since this is a buff, uh, I don't expect to speak more than uh, everybody else. So I'll just turn on the list of topics. So you should now see the list of topics that I've gathered from that, that people sent me. Um, I'll give you a few seconds to, to read them, but the goal is that we talk about what you want to talk about. So uh, if you have anything else to add, that even if it's, if, it's, if it's not on this list, then just bring it up. Uh, we have about 25 minutes, and uh, the plan is that we can keep talking after that. Uh, I know that the presentation right after is also dwarf related, so anyway, I'm personally interested. But we, a bit later in the day, we can take some time and join the hack room uh, to, to, to continue the, any discussions. Uh, so yeah, the list of topics. The first one, moving of GB support and GB server. Uh, so that's a move that's been done maybe in, in the last year to move it to the top level of our repo. That's something that was led by Tom Chumi. Uh, I thought we could have a little update, but I don't see Tom in here. So I guess it maybe won't be possible. But uh, yeah, I'd like to know if there's anything left. Are there any problems left to address? Or is, is there anything more we want to move, for example, from GDB to GB support so it can properly be shared? Because I know that GB server uses build files from GB to build. Uh, a topic that um, Jeremy would like to say a few words about the free or any BSD version of GB server they are working on. Uh, the next two ones are some small cleanups that sometimes large uh, cleanups I've been working on. I'd like to, before I continue, if there's any uh, comments on that, that'll be the time. Uh, Joel, so we had jo Joel. Uh, Bro Becker, who is our release manager, he's not there to uh, currently. He'll be there later in the day. So if we have things to talk with him, uh, we can do so in the chat room. But he wanted to have any feedback on the new version numbering scheme. So we aligned our since the latest release uh, on RGC does. It, so is there any feedback on that? Uh, I, and I see that. So I see a lot of uh, people I know in the room, con contributors, and maybe there are in the room. There's also people who. who plan to start contributing to GDB in the future. So if anybody has, is working on some big feature and you know would like to ask questions or just say, I'm working on this so that we can know we know what to expect, uh, I think it would be interesting to, to share and can discuss that. And if you have a, something you'd like to contribute, either in your architecture, feature, or whatever, if you'd like to, if you're not sure about how to proceed, how to split things up, what's the right process, then feel free to ask questions. We have a few GDB maintainers in the room, so that would be the right time. So uh, I'd like to start by giving Jeremy a few, well, a bit of time to talk about, because he wanted to talk about this FreeBSD version of GB server they're working on. So 
I'm curious to hear about that. Oh, so thank there. you. Um, I'm still here, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm here all day. The, um, so it was just to flag up that because of a project we're working on, we need to use a GDB server under FreeBSD. It's an embedded FreeBSD system, which is when we discovered that somewhere post-2005, GDB server on FreeBSD got broken. Um, we have started some work, it's a bit slow, on doing a FreeBSD version of GDB server. And it's just to say, I'd be really interested if anyone else has got the same problem, we can share the effort. Um, so do you know, or I've never seen GDB server bits uh, for FreeBSD. Do you know it was added in 2005 or removed in 2005? I, uh when when was the last time that it that or when were they removed from the tree do you have any idea uh so i i've not been it's mostly andrew burgess who's been uh, working on this um but uh he uh he can't be with us today so um i don't know he just mentioned to me that it, it was there once uh back in okay. 2005 where how it got lost i don't know i don't know the history of it it's just that we discovered that when we wanted it. So there, there certainly isn't anything recent that we can build on. Um, so we've started the work, or I say we, Andrew has started the work of putting together a free BSD version of GDB server. And I'm just curious to know if anyone's interested. I mean, most people use free BSD native, so it's not an issue. It's just that we happen to be working with an embedded free BSD system. So we really need a GDB server on it. Um. Do you happen to be in contact with John Baldwin, who's working uh, on uh, FreeBSD? At least he contributes a lot to GDB uh, for FreeBSD. I, so I say I, I, I'm not directly working on it. Uh, that's a good okay. point. I, I will have a chat with John Baldwin. Yeah, uh, I'm sure that Andrew knows about him since he's. They're both active on the mailing list, so. But uh, uh, you know, John would be the right person to answer any free BSD real quick questions. Uh, Elena is asking. Elena is asking anybody taking notes. So, is there any volunteer? I don't think I can do that myself while trying to uh, while I speak. So, is there any volunteer who could just? Make a log of what we've I'll, been talking I'll about. Drop some things, I'll drop some things down as we go on the shared notes. OK. Um, I, no, I, I thought, we, so if there, there isn't any other topic coming up, uh, let's go through the list. I, uh, let, 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 even though Tom Tromi is not here, uh, do we have any, unless he does join, no. Um, do we have any feedback on the move of GB support and GB server to the top level? Uh, personally, I, you know, I, I, I wasn't sure in the beginning, but it turned out I think to be great. Uh, it really showed that the way GB server was built before was really kind of a hack. Now it's just one program, like any other, in the bin utils GDB tree. Uh, there was a bit of, you know, it it it, it, it shook things. So there's a few things that broke in the beginning, but I think for the most part, it's quite stable. Um, but is there any else, anything else that needs to be done that anybody knows about uh, in this area? So historically, a GDB server um, is very much for full operating systems. So Linux, hopefully FreeBSD soon, and one or two of the larger RTOSs. Um, but there's a whole other class of GDB servers, which are the bare metal RTOS servers. And typically people use something like OpenOCD for that, um, which is actually GPL licensed. Um, it's always struck me as a question of, should we actually have a framework for bare metal GDB servers and not just full operating system GDB servers? And I can see the case both ways, but uh, since we're discussing what we should have in the tree, I'll flag that one up here. I think that's a good question. Uh, yeah, you, you probably wouldn't want to run or to 
maybe not use the same program for full-on operating systems versus uh, embedded systems. Well, if we could, it would be great, but I don't know how practical it would be. Uh, so yeah, the question would be, do, do we want to have a kind of second GB server that's more like for embedded in the tree? And my question would be, so personally, I think it would be nice. I don't have a personal need for it. Uh, is, is there anything we could start from that already exists that people use and they would just like to have it maintained upstream instead of a bit everywhere? So you mentioned OpenOCD, but I think OpenOCD is also is more for accessing. Oh, that's right. It's for accessing real targets. Yeah, yes. So it, uh, it, 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 it focuses on real targets, but it has a GDB server in it. Um, okay. Uh, uh, we have a GDB server we use. We started out as a teaching exercise to explain how to write GDB servers. So that might be a possible basis for an upstream uh, bare metal GDB server. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, there is a slight challenge with bare metal GDB servers in that they, the GPL license, um, once you start engaging at a low level, particularly if you start engaging with simulations, you start applying the GPL to simulations. Um, and that might mean exposing the actual hardware chip design. And given the way chips are designed, most people don't have actually ownership of the entire IP of their chip to be able to do that. Um, so it may prove that actually it turns out to be something that's quite hard to do in a meaningful way for a GPL licensed tool. Right. Um, although that applies to when they actually want to distribute it, if they want to, if you just want to use use it locally for your own simulator. And for example, because I was thinking, um, so Kevin mentioned this old project called RDA, which is the remote debugger agent. Uh, I don't know, Kevin, I don't know much about it. Do you want to explain a bit what that was? Is it, is it relevant to what we would like to, or what we're discussing now? How, how did that work? Maybe. Yeah, I'm here. Um, Thanks. Yeah, so Red Hat used to use it uh, for some of our embedded projects a long time ago. It's uh, up on Sourceware. I haven't built it in many years. I don't know. It's, it's probably bit rotted, but it would be something for something to look at if you're thinking about uh, an embedded type of uh, framework. Um, yeah, I can't remember too much more about it than that, but uh, given time, I might remember more. <laughs> uh, do you remember what was the concept, for example? Was it like in some kind of a base of code and that offers an interface, and then you just implement some callbacks, but that common code yeah. managed all the yeah. serial communication and the, the protocol aspects of it? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, I, I'm remembering now. Andrew Cagney, I think, designed a lot of it. Uh, and I, as I recall, Jim Blandy and Michael Schneider had a hand in some of it. Uh, eventually, I got to maintaining it for a while. Um, but uh, yeah, you could kind of drop in. Uh, you know, if you needed a oh, a new embedded board or something like that with a particular interface, it wasn't too hard to hook things up. I think we uh, I think we were connecting to ICES and things like that. So, yeah. uh, Pedro, go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Um, so. I've looked at the REA code base uh, before, and it, it was actually surprising to me that it was pretty much complete. Like, uh, I noticed that it also had like a Windows port. Uh, 
even before GDB Server was ported to, to Windows. Um, and it didn't look very much different from what GDB Server is. I don't think there's any technical reason that GDB Server couldn't be used for non-OS uh, targets. It's uh, much more reasonably abstracted nowadays than it was maybe a decade ago <clears throat> when I started looking at GDB Server back then. Um, it's mainly nowadays an issue of license, as Jeremy was, was saying. I think that RDA, if I recall correctly, and this was before my time, I think Red Hat tried to contribute RDA to, to the FSF and it was rejected, something like that. And it never got much use in the community uh, because it was seen as kind of a side thing from Red Hat, not uh, an upstream community project. That's my understanding, and I wasn't involved in it at the time. It's my understanding from uh, talking with other people about it. Um, but by looking at the code, I had the thought that you know we could do the same thing with the GB service matter of license. So the question then becomes, would we want to import a different thing inside our code base if it's going to be very similar, just because it has a different license? Or if we really want to follow that path, maybe we should split it a little bit more technically so that we have like the core parts neatly separated from the um, operating system implementations. And then we could rebrand that as a lib GDB server thing. And maybe we could talk to the FSF to relicense that. Uh, so that we would technically still have only one implementation. Uh, that's an open question I have. Uh, I used to think that C++ would, was, was a blocker. But uh, it's my understanding that even Jeremy's um, project is C++ based, and they use it a lot in embedded stuff. Uh, Jeremy, please correct me if I'm wrong there. You're, you're correct. It, it's it's C++ 14, I think. Yeah. Yeah, we just, uh, I like. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think I, I like Pedro's idea of uh, splitting out a, a lib GDB server. That would have the core components, and and it, I know that uh, that was actually one of the reasons that Red Hat uh, used RDA for these things was that we controlled the license. So there was a you know kind of a free version that other folks could use, but we also, if we needed to connect it to something that had uh, you know proprietary IP, we could do so because. Uh, we, you know, kept part of the license that, you know, that, that we could do that. Uh, so yeah, kind of a relicensing of the the core part, so it could be put into something proprietary. Might be, uh, well, I, I think I, as a practical matter, I think it's a good idea. Yeah, I'm also not very good with license stuff, so uh, I'm not sure how that would work. But just to understand, Pedro, because uh, I, I don't think it would be a good idea either to have two different implementations in the trees. So we'd have GB server and this other thing on the side, because this thing on the side would be doomed to bit rot and be unmaintained, and it would be very hard to test uh, upstream, at least. So, I, but I could very well see having this legit server that and have the GB server program implemented as using that, so that at least the, the lib would always be uh, tested and exercised. Uh, not all ports or all implementations behind that lib would be, could be tested upstream, but at least the, the lib itself. And yeah, it would avo avoid duplication of functionality as well. So is that what you were thinking of, implementing GB server using that library, and then that library kit could be used by other people like I don't know, a Volgrind or QEMU that have GDB RSP yeah. interfaces. Right. I was saying, yeah, that, that's a potential path. Uh, I, I, if we did separate the core aspects of GDB server from the, you know, the, the Linux backend, the Windows backend, then, of course, GDB server, the, pro the program would consume that library as well. And to me, it's a matter of who wants to do this? Who wants to spend time you know, 
actually working on on this is, is it worth it um, I'm also happy with a world where we have different GDB server implementations it's not like the remote protocol parts are very complicated uh, it's, it's not where the core of of, of a, a typical server is like the that's not the hard parts the hard parts tend to be the back end and so and also offering a, a, a library interface ask the question like what guarantees do we have with stability and everything like we do a lot of efforts to keep the remote protocol itself backwards compatible and everything uh, so that's the interface people currently use and like you say Pedro it's not the hardest protocol to just parse and use that's the hard part now if we do in a C interface we have to make sure it's at least somewhat backwards compatible though otherwise other programs I, if that can see me. yeah I, I'd support Pedro's view actually if I'd suggest starting with multiple architectures and then look at unifying them the reason is that you might find that bare metal actually requires additional features that you don't get in Linux. Uh, for example, it's perfectly normal to have multi-core bare or simple, hard, deeply embedded systems where the mapping between address spaces and execution threads is non-trivial, um, certainly compared to Linux. So you may find that's, um, that's a factor. So starting with two and then working what the common themes are to put them into a GDB server, libgdb server is a good idea and it really needs one of those companies that are paying for you know bare metal gdb support to decide actually having it upstream would be a good thing so i think that's those of us who work commercially can see who's willing to pay for the work yeah i think as a community it would definitely be worth it but yeah the problem is that yeah, somebody has to um, Mark in the chat mentions that yeah, the Valgrind GB server implementation is a hacked up copy lifted from GB a long time ago. So, and that's the kind of thing, the kind of things that I don't find. With, I mean, I understand why it wasn't this way, but it's not ideal in that while well, GDB's version evolves, the one that was copied. Yeah. yeah. I'm under the impression that it's stuck because of GPL v2. Maybe I'm incorrect. And this is stale information, but I think that was the original thing. Uh, okay, maybe. Okay, so I think we all agree that all technically <laughs> good, something good, but there's licenses and also who would like to work on that. But at least at the, as, as an upstream <clears throat> maintainer, that's something I would very very happy to look at and help anybody who like to work on that. So did we cover this topic journey? Uh, yes, yes. Um and I noticed we've got no minutes left to cover all the other topics. Already? Wow. Yeah. It's twenty five. <laughs> it really fast. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, the 25 minutes goes really quick, but uh, at least that's one interesting topic we talked about. But uh, I'd like to know if, like I said, the, the, the talk that's just after the Bottage Server is about Dwarf, and you know I've been quite involved in the last year in learning about Dwarf 5, things like that, to review patches and otherwise. Uh, so I'd like to, and I'd like to, 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 to listen, but if people if people would like to continue in the hack room right away I'll, I'll also join but do people also mind if we wait after this talk or I like just I just like to know what people would like to do uh, stay for the next one or leave for to the hack room A quick question I think there are five rooms is that correct that we cannot create extra so how are people yeah. that? There's a message on chat. Hack room two is available if you'd like to continue the discussion. Yeah, first come. So first I think GDB people, we can co coordinate on GDB IRC for that. Yeah. Also. 
Right. Thank you very much then, Simon. Um, our first session successfully completed within the time interval. Um, we'll let people get their cells sorted out and their new slides up. Um, and I will just... Uh, So, Mark, um, uh, I was. Uh, we'll we'll start you at exactly half past for the benefit of anyone who's live, uh, live, uh, watching the live stream. So we've you've got a couple of minutes. Um, I'll there we are. You've got your slides. Okay, uh, Mark. Okay. There they are. If uh, we'll just give it a couple of minutes for anyone who's transferring over. And Simon Marchi, are you still here, Simon? Uh, yep. Yeah, okay. Got... Simon's take okay, Simon, you're taking over as me from me as moderator. I oh right. So I I have to stay anyway. That's true. Until at least until Joel. All right. Okay. But I, I'm currently joined in the two rooms, so I'll be able to listen to each one, one ear each. Yeah, okay. And Sarah uh, will put oops. up the time. Sarah will put up the time Sorry, Mark. warnings. Yeah. You'll, you'll get a notification five, three, and one minute, Mark. Okay, thank you. Oh, great. And I can. Okay. This works. You can. I can. Uh, Sarah did. Sarah did say that her laptop was getting a bit overloaded um, while she's tracking the sorted things at once. So um, we'll just give it. I think you've got about a minute, and then. We'll stick exactly to time for anyone who's set an alarm to see this particular session. Yeah. Um, Jeremy? Yeah. So, okay. Uh, so, if you want to cut, would like to copy the notes you, you took, um, do you know if there's a place to put it so that it's, it can be available in for I'll, I'll, people I'll who would like to know? While, yeah, I'll, I'll sort that out and work out where we're going to put them. Yeah, we'll probably put okay. them up on the, um, the wiki or something. I'll take a copy. Please. Yeah, okay. Okay. I think you're there, Mark. Okay, let's start this. So, um, when I proposed this talk, uh, or buff, I was a bit um, ambitious, so I thought, let's discuss making Dwarf 5 the default, uh, and uh, see if we can support Dwarf 64, and single file split Dwarf, and uh, have a discussion about debug types, and that was a bit much. Um, so um, I actually looked at making Dwarf 5 the default for GC, uh, 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 but that took up all my time. So I've better prepared for that, uh, uh, but the others are just ideas. Um, so, why would we want to finally move to Dwarf 5? Um, 
I believe the standard has been out for four years already. Uh, and you see, really already supports uh, most of it and it supports it in a uh, nice way in that if, if you don't use any of the extended features, it doesn't use uh, extended uh, forms or uh, alternative tables. Uh, uh, so it's, it's what do you see? Uh, outputs as Dwarf 5 is actually not that hard to uh, support. Um, it makes uh, uh, the Dwarf uh, a bit smaller. Uh, it has less relocations, uh, uh, mainly because uh, a lot of the ranges lists used to be just tables of two addresses and now they can be offsets. Uh, 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 from a base uh, address or from each other, uh, which makes things uh, uh, a bit more efficient. Um, and uh, it's really easier to reason about uh, than uh, the GNU extensions that we used in the past because, well, now things are actually documented, standardized, uh, so other tools can also uh, help with it. Um, so basically what I did was make it the default, uh, look what breaks, uh, 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 and well, look what breaks is I looked at C, C++, uh, and I mainly looked at the GC, LVTILS, BINUTILS, and GDB uh, test suits. Um, uh, the, uh, <coughs> Uh, I did send some patches to uh, the GC uh, uh, patches main list. Uh, uh, one of them is kind of, <laughs> uh, 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 well, uh, I don't know. Um, Alex isn't here. No, too bad. Um, the idea with location views is that they are in the lock list, uh, but they are not uh, for for older dwarf. Uh, the lock list was uh, uh, really you had to read it together with the CU. Um, in dwarf five, almost all the tables are kind of standalone, have their own header, uh, their own base addresses. Uh, uh, so. Uh, you could read them standalone, and the lock, uh, location views make that uh, kind of hard because they are uh, they are still a GNU extension, not standardized. Uh, there are actually two forms that you can do this in, uh, uh, but both aren't standard to R5. So one of the suggestions I made was don't enable location views by default for to R5. Let's see what people say. Yay! Or boo. <laughs> uh, oh, there's a chat. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's kind of problematic. We, we should discuss with, with Alex what exactly he wants and uh, what's, what's the way forward. Because it's, it's not standardized, we, we can come up with a different extension perhaps or... Yeah. No, 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 we, we can. It, this was mainly, oh, this is something that uh, both binutils and uh, elfutils can read the location lists, uh, uh, to our five location lists, uh, uh, standalone, but not if uh, uh, location views are uh, enabled. And because there are two ways of enabling them, we probably have to discuss and make sure our users and videos support that. Um, so the the good old in the in the chat Ben asked about Fortran. No, I didn't look at all at Fortran. Sorry. Um, and yes, there is a proposal to add location views. Uh, uh, to dwarf six, but I'm not sure if 
anybody is actually working yet on Dwarf 6. So. It, uh, yeah, it, it, it hasn't started yet, so... Yeah. Um, yeah, so I didn't really look at Fortran or Ada. I could have, but, well, ran out of time. Um, I think they're fine. <laughs> well, at, at least in, in, in you see the test suit, uh, if you enable Dwarf 5, uh, there aren't that many things that need fixing up, and they all uh, are just uh, uh, a test that scan the assembly generated, and then some forms change. So I just uh, made uh, 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 made a test, broke the new forms, and that was it. So GCC itself seems okay. Uh, except for a couple of tests that need a fix in Bing Utils LD. Uh, we'll get to that. Um, GDB, uh, the test suit looks really good. Uh, again, I looked only at the C and the C one. Uh, the, the only thing that GDB has an issue with is that uh, in WAR5, static data members are no longer members of a class, uh, but are actual variables. Uh, that breaks a couple of test cases. I don't think it really breaks uh, debugging itself. Uh, um, uh, the, the only kind of odd thing about the uh, static uh, data members is that the variables can sometimes disappear if you don't reference them. And I think we kind of want to keep them in the, the debug outputs, even if they are not used, because that's what people expect to see. Um, so being utils was kind of, I was kind of surprised because it needed uh, very small fixes. Uh, probably nobody ever really <laughs> used uh, uh, built Bing Utils itself with Tor 5 enabled. So um, the, the, the there's one fix for LD which sometimes tries to read the debug ranges, and of course now there's debug range lists. Uh, I think that's only an issue if uh, LD wants to provide warnings and uh, 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 reads the dwarf to give better error messages. Uh, the only problem is that if it can't read the debug message, it gives an error about not being able to read the, uh, the, the debug info instead of the, the original error, which is kind of odd. Uh, I, I have a fix for that. Uh, uh, which kind of should go in. Um, the, the problematic thing, so this is actually all good. Uh, the, uh, I, I think if it was just uh, Elf Utils, Bin Utils, CC itself, uh, uh, GDB, uh, we could just switch on to uh, switch to our five on. Uh, Felgrind, uh, RPM debug and uh, edit, and DWZ uh, needs patches. I don't think it's too much work. Uh, I know Jan already has uh, most of the patches for our debug edit. Uh, uh, I looked a bit at Felgrind, uh, should not be that much work. DWZ is a bit more work, but I think we can manage. And of course, that doesn't need to be ready till GC11 is out and distros want to pick at it. Um, yeah, Jacob. Oh. Yeah, uh, on the DWZ side, it's, it's actually three three different things. One, one is to, to be able to parse the Dwarf 5 headers and, and uh, new forms and so on. Uh, the second part is to switch to using the now standard way of, of marking uh, 
the multiple files uh, located somewhere else, way which which is now standard in var five, and the last part is is optimizations, which which we can do afterwards. It, it doesn't have yeah. to be before GCC eleven. By optimizations, I, I mean mainly being able to use the better, more compact forms based on how how many how many dice are there and what kind of attributes they have. But the first two parts probably need to be done. And after after the second part is done, we need to also change all the consumers again so that they, they handle the var 5 way of looking for the multiple files. Yeah, that, uh, that, that might be a bit more work, but I think if they handle uh, dwarf in a, a normal file, they also will be able to easily handle it. Uh, yeah, it, it shouldn't be that hard. It's just a different way of how to express the same thing. Yeah. Um, so one thing that, that yes, better. I was just going to say that for GDB, there's one extra issue, and it's kind of it's it's dwarf five related. It, it's the 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 bug name section. The implementation in GDB is yeah. supposedly complete, but it's not it's not really complete because uh, what we do is we dump into the debug name section the same thing that we would dump into the GDB index file, which is not dwarf five compliant. <laughs> so we like we encapsulate things nicely in a dwarf five way, but the contents are not compliant. So uh, if we ever want to switch to dwarf five index files, we would need to fix that. Uh, otherwise, we would be stuck in a GDB only then. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, yeah. Do, do you know if other tools use the GDB index file directly or? As consumers, um, yes, no, I don't. I don't. Okay. LDB uses the dwarf five thing. Okay. And Clang emits it, I think, in a compliant way. Uh, okay. And, and does do they do it in the compiler or have they? Because they, I, they, I think, do it in the compiler somehow. Okay. That's interesting. I don't know how you would do that. So, because you 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 have to. Uh, so they, they they parse all the CUs during the compile. I don't know. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, let, let, let's put a shared note. Uh, uh, look into the generator. You, I, I think you can emit something uh, from the compiler. Uh, if, if you compile just a single compilation unit, then you emit standard compliant debug names for, for that, but that generally is not really useful. So I would think that they throw it away during link time and, and build it again during linking or something. Yeah. Okay, but the, the, that is indeed something to look at that I didn't add to that list. Um, so the uh, uh, one thing that you see uh, doesn't do is, or actually it does, uh, uh, it uh, outputting of debug lights. It, uh, uh, it passes that on to uh, the assembler because the assembler knows more about uh, uh, where all their sections go. Um, uh, but that means that currently uh, GCC, even in TWAR5 mode, generates a TWAR4 uh, debug line uh, section. That actually works great. Uh, so maybe we don't want to change that <laughs> because everything uh, handles uh, uh, version 4 debug lines. Uh, but bin utils does support uh, uh, GDARF 5. Now, uh, uh, the only problem is that it is a bit buggy. 
uh, uh, so I have some patches uh, uh, for to uh, generate uh, better uh, version five uh, debug clients. Those are those are already in master, but uh, uh, maybe we can get them backported. Uh, is Nick here? Yes, I am, and yes, you can get them backported. Okay, great. Um, uh, 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 basically, what, what we we need some configure tests to make sure uh, Binutils uh, is doing the right thing, and maybe also a configure test for LD uh, that it reads the the uh, debug range this correctly. Uh, but then I think what we want is uh, uh, from the, the, the SM spec pass on the dwarf version to uh, the assembler. I looked at it, but <laughs> spec files. If somebody can help me there, that would be appreciated. I guess, uh, well, uh, if, if you can come up with, with, a, with a test we, which can be used during configure for, well, uh, it depends. Either either we just turn on the switch whenever uh, assembler supports the switch. That's very easy and that can be done and I can do it. Or or we do some correctness test, whether, whether assembler emits something correct. And in that case, we need to find out what, what the bugs were and how to how to detect buggy assembler yeah. don't enable it um I'll, I'll have a go at creating a test for you okay <laughs> yeah. um so this is basically what i had for uh, uh five i would really like to see if we can enable twire five by default now uh, because if we don't enable it we don't find the bugs in the consumers uh, uh, and if the consumers don't uh, aren't ready by the the time we get to stage one then maybe you can switch it back that would be my suggestion okay uh, some bonus discussions for the last 10 minutes. Uh, I don't have patches for this, um, uh, although I think the patches aren't too, uh, uh, too hard. Uh, so first is, I think it would be an interesting idea to have an F dwarf 64, F dwarf 32. Uh, uh, switch which simply says offsets are 32 bit or 64 bit uh, because there are currently uh, uh, programs that run out of uh, 32 bit uh, uh, debug info or debug string sections and then can't reference them anymore. Um, I think it's an interesting idea, but maybe it's stupid. Uh, uh, the, 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 the. Did you measure the overhead of dwarf 64? Because I think in such cases it's already better to use the dwarf, which has overhead just about 8%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it is. But on the other hand, the debug info is already ginormous. So, uh, and it would be a, a quick solution. The only problem is everything needs to be compiled with uh, either uh, 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 or because otherwise CUs can't reference all other CUs. The problem is that, for example, LLDB has completely dropped all the code for DARF64 because there is no use for it because that DARF stores that easily. So that's the problem with compatibility with LVM. Oh, okay. That's interesting because most other things uh, seem to. It's it's not that hard to add, of course, because uh, you can just read the header. Um, 
I, I think it, it would be still nice to enable it so that something can be actually tested this because right now there are no producers so nobody tests it except that GCC supports it on some dead IRIX target or something. Yeah, and I believe Spark for some reason uses it. But then, anyway, yeah. Um, then the yeah, question is, is what, what switch? Because there is the big debate whether it should be F so, minus F something or minus G something, and yeah. whether it should take equals 32 or 64 or minus 32 or 64, right? and so on. So <laughs> we need to decide how to name it. But otherwise, the, the support really is there just right now is, is, is compile time rather. Oh, well, it's, it's behind a macro rather than uh, behind an option. Yeah. OK, only three minutes. Let's, this is the other idea. Um, uh, uh, currently, split dwarf is kind of harder um, uh, uh, because it generates a separate file, which makes things hard with uh, uh, build systems. Uh, 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 Clang actually has a cute hack that I believe LTO also uses, use SHF exclude for the DWO sections, keep them in the same file. Uh, and uh, 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 then the linker ignores them. They are still on disk, of course, but they won't be in uh, 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 the, the link object. Um, uh, this is actually uh, supported by GDB. Alpha Utils doesn't, but I have some patches that uh, uh, work with this format. I think it's interesting. On the other hand, I'm not completely sure people really like Split Dwarf that much. So, um, yeah, I guess we have one minute left <laughs> to do the big debug types <laughs> discussion. Um, uh, Jan did some uh, uh, measurements. Uh, uh, I think uh, doing it after the link is still more beneficial, but of course, if you can do the duplication before the link phase or during the link phase. I think that's uh, uh, nice. Um, I think it is a bit of a natural fit for the early debug scheme. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, it makes it harder to reference uh, anything except the big types uh, and uh, referencing has a large overhead. I don't know if, if people want to look at, into this. Uh, I think that's the time. Let's see when we are getting moved away. <laughs> May I ask uh, if there is therefore a plan to port the DWZ2 dwarf 5 that was discussed before I haven't seen such plan so far, but yeah. So yeah. So w w w one thing could be to uh, emit them and then have DWZ uh, actually remove them again, <laughs> make them normal uh, 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 references. No, I didn't really know the debug types specifically, but more about var 5 because DWZ currently does not support var 5. So, if there is the plan to port it to var 5, you, you, you mean DWC? Yes, 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 DWZ. Um, yeah. Hi, this yeah. is Tom. Um, so, uh, it's not currently on my list is what I can say about it. Yeah, but uh, well, then I put it on my list.
so uh, uh, yeah, we, we, we have to wrap up. But um, I think the plain DWC uh, support for Dwarf 5, at least Dwarf 5 as emitted by DC, isn't that hard. And I, I can do that. And now Jeremy is going to say we are, yeah. have to leave. Mark, okay, we're, sorry. We're running out of time. <laughs> so yes. It's okay. We did allow a five minute gap just to allow, you know, that rounding off. Hack Room 2 is still going strong, full of GDB types. So I suggest let's transfer this conversation over to Hack Room 2 for all the, uh, uh, for going into more dwarf. It's a, it's a great topic. And if uh, I weren't supposed to be here moderating, I'd be over there piling in as well. So thank you very much, Mark. Um, and um, in a couple of minutes, we'll move on to lightning talks. Thank you. I should know. I've taken some notes. They're in the shared notes area. We will get those captured and, and pushed up to the um, uh, wiki if nowhere else. That's great, Frank. Thank you. I will let you, if you haven't done so already, please take the presenter over. You have done. Great. Um, we'll just wait to the top of the hour before carrying on, just to give anyone switching over a chance to carry on. Okay. Doop, 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 doop. You're good and visible, Frank. <laughs> and we can hear you. Eliminate any signs of personality from the backdrop, so uh, I should be as, as mellow and mild as possible today. Uh, the benefits of my bedroom. So, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, okay, so uh, Frank, it's um, we've, we've got two of these to fit in the half hour, so we'll flag up five minutes, three minutes, and one minute for a 10 minute slot, and then that should give you a good lightning time. Sounds good. Half a minute to go. Exciting. Aaron, if you're in a call, you should, uh, let's see, let's get you into the... Uh, Aaron, he's showing in the list of, he's the showing in the list of attendees. Um, can I designate him a presenter also? Uh, because he'll be sharing yes. his screen to do good. All right. Yeah, if you can't, I can. And if, yep. he, if he, if he there we are, that's it. Yeah, you've made him a presenter. All right. So yeah, he'll be uh, sharing his screen to show a little demo um, at the appropriate moment. Okay, that's good. <laughs> it, okay, you're good to go. It's the top of the hour. Let us away. Thank you all for coming. I'm surprised so many folks showed up. I'm very happy to see you guys. Hello, I'm Frank Eigler. I'm a Red Hat developer. Aaron, uh, my close personal friend, is another Red Hat developer, and we're here to talk to you about Debug Info D. Uh, let's see. Do I advance these pages? Oh, no. God. <laughs> Frank, you need to be a presenter while you're presenting, so take over the presenter. Oh. There's only ever one presenter. Well, that explains everything. All right, very good. Let us move on to slide two and let's get it over with. Very good. Debug Info D is a program dealing with debug info. What is debug info? It is a dwarf debugging data that uh, if those of you who heard Mark's talk in the last, few, last half hour will be totally familiar with. Um, we are talking more about the logistics as opposed to details of the format here. So lo logistics are interesting to us because debug info is, as he says, as we all know, is large and is not routinely distributed on every place where um, 
where it should be. Uh, so we just stripped and it's large. So uh, and that makes debugging uh, very difficult to impossible at times. So debug info D is an effort as a tool to make the distribution of that debug info as easy as possible um, after the fact. And it's been this, it's been public for about nine months now. It's part of Alphutil's 0.178 and a bunch of distros uh, ship it already. And we hope many more of them do. Slide three. All right. So a tool like this is nothing without client support. We want uh, all debugging type tools to be able to uh, pull down the debug info and source code from uh, this type of service. So we spent, uh, mostly Aaron has spent a lot of effort in making sure that uh, standard debugger-like tools can handle this thing. So there have been patches that have been merged into GB and released all over the place and uh, system tap, perf, a few those beans, those dynins, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a, a suite of, of debug info consuming tools out there. Um, we haven't gotten to all of, the, all of them and uh, we have a status page that I'll show at the end, which indicates which uh, we'd still appreciate a lot of help with. Uh, the nice thing is that there's a little library that uh, a C library and a shell script uh, or a shell command line interface that's available. The C library is so small that and so kind of easy to use that it, it takes only about a dozen, two dozen lines to add client side support code. And all this works because of the magic of uh, build IDs, which is a unique hexadecimal, unique binary uh, hash that's built into every binary that's built um, by modern compiler or tool chain uh, since, well, gosh, a decade now, uh, at least on Linux, but equivalent things are available elsewhere too, to some extent. Anyway, so if the client gets the debug, uh, gets the build ID out of the um, target binary that's trying to debug, whether it's a process or a dead file, sends it to the server, uh, and gets back the uh, binary code or uh, debug info or source code, source file that is necessary. I, yeah, I bookshelves. Ben, I will draw bookshelves for next time I give this talk. How about that? There you go. So anyway, uh, the easiest way to use, uh, there's a single uniform uh, configuration for all these clients to talk to these servers. It's an environment variable called debug info D underscore URLs. And that's it. You set it to a server and that's, that's all, everything else is just automatic. The, uh, source code, everything just downloads uh, on the fly and it's as fast as possible. Servers, well, so uh, part of the uh, debug info div work is of course, not just the client library, but the server itself. This is a small, uh, very fairly small C++ program. Um, it's self-contained, it's very well behaved. So it runs well as a container, runs well as a system D service, runs well as a hand started uh, little gadget. It's a small, uh, purposefully small program. You aim it at some directories, whether it's a build tree full of uh, binaries that you made uh, or RPMs or Debian files or whatever, kind of standard archiving formats or, or distro formats, uh, you just download a bunch tell the server what directory they're in, it will sort of transparently decompress them, index the contents by build ID, and then be immediately ready to serve those contents uh, via HTTP. So it does not need to uh, you know, unpack everything. It does not need a, a weird uh, custom file system hierarchy. It just uh, gives you the content on the fly without any sort of temporary uh, you know, extra storage. It's monitorable via Prometheus as it should be. Um, it, uh, so Jeff's question about abort, uh, it uh, it kind of supplements the retrace server. We actually would like to have those guys use us as a debug info uh, source as opposed to having to upload a core file somewhere else for analysis. Um, uh, we're getting Peter's idea, making user lib debug, uh, fuse mount. Uh, it's a possibility there. There's another project. Um, gosh, I forget who built it, that, that worked kind of like that. This is a much lower uh, complexity kind of solution than that, but it, we, we have considered that, but it's not the, uh, exactly. Anywho, let us move on to the next slide, keeping things going. Uh, we have at least one or actually we have a couple of public servers already uh, out on the wide open internet. Um, this debug info d.alfutils.org is already open, has been serviced for six months or so now. It carries packages from uh, Fedora, CentOS, Debian, Ubuntu. Uh, the OpenSUSE friends of ours have run their own server for Tumbleweed, which is always kept up to date. And we are, you know, anticipating over time, we'd like, uh, 
more distros to run them. ISVs can run them, like you know, Mozilla Foundation can run them for any binaries they distribute, and then that will make uh, that stuff uh, downloadable. Yeah. I know Mozilla has their own system, but again, uh, this is uh, th this can function as a more cross ISV uh, standard kind of thing. Um, all right, and that's it. Demo time. Over to Aaron. So let me see if I can designate him presenter, and he can uh, show us this thing working. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, yeah, loud and clear. If anything, too, too loud and too clear. Okay. Uh, well, I'll try to back up a bit. I'm trying to share my screen. One second. Uh, it's always that it is screen sharing. Allow. Okay, I see something happening. Am I am I uh, too loud now? Is this all right? Just carry on. Okay. Um, all right. Hi everyone. Going to give a brief demonstration of how to use Debug Info D with System Tap and GDB. Going to start with System Tap. Uh, our goal here is to instrument a process with a System Tap probe that prints a timed call graph with function parameters and return values. Uh, in order to do so, we're going to need debug information for the process we wish to instrument. If we don't have this, then System Tap's not going to be able to compile the probe. So the command, the command we want to run uh, is this here. We're instrumenting the tree executable. Um, and since we don't have, oh, that noise is, should be disabled, but oh well. Um, since we don't have the debug info installed, uh, the, the compilation fails. We could manually use DNF to install the debug info, but this isn't always convenient or possible. So let's start up a debug info D server that has indexed the debug info we're looking for. So that's stored in this build directory. And I'll start up the server using this command. So the server has indexed um, those files, the, the tree debug info files. And when I try running the system tap script again, uh, things should work properly this time, which you can see here. Um, since the executables uh, share build IDs with their debug info, system tap is able to query the server for the missing debug info using the build ID it finds in the tree executable. So on the left here, you can see uh, the server received a request for trees debug info, and on the right, the instrumented tree process was ran, and system top was able to successfully produce the call graph uh, using debug info got from the server. Um, another feature of system top that uses debug info D is the ability to specify probe targets according to build ID. When we want to instrument an executable, we generally, with system top, we specify either the path of the executable or a process ID. But debug info D now gives us an easy way to target a specific build of an executable uh, with its build ID. So here's another stop command. That's the same as the last one, except I've replaced the path of the tree executable with the, the build ID of that specific uh, tree, tree executable. Um, and now I will run the server. I will uh, run that command. And in this case, uh, system tap queries the server for the tree executable in addition to the debug info so that it is able to compile and run the probe, which you can see on the right. Um, this feature is useful when you want to target a specific build of an executable or shared library or when you want to cross compile a system tap module for a different platform. So now I will show debug info D working uh, with GDB as it runs inside a Fedora container. I'll start up the container. So for this example, I'm simply going to run Python 3 under GDB. And since this container doesn't have any debug info or source files installed for Python 3 or glibc, um, we're not going to get oh, too much information from GDB at this point, which you can see here, no debugging symbols found. Uh, so we will uh, index Python, the Python 3 and glibc debug info and source files, which I have stored over here in this uh, RPMs directory, and I'll index them with the debug info D server using this uh, command. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Can you make the font a little bigger? Because here you can blow up the screen, but in the live stream, they, they can't see very well. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for that. Hopefully that's better. 
Um, where was I? Yes, RPMs. Okay, so uh, it's going to take a moment to index all those Python and glibc RPMs, and I will uh, I will now point um, GDB to the debug info D server uh, by setting this environment variable. And whenever I'm GDB again, we should see the extra output from the, sorry, see extra output regarding files that GDB queries the debug info D server for. So let's run GDB again. In this case, we can see downloading separate debug info for Python 3 and uh, some other debug info files. Um, so now GDB has access to the debug info. And when I run Python 3, GDB is going to query debug info D for debug info of any shared libraries that are dynamically linked, which we can see here. Um, and as I attempt to print source files associated with uh, each stack frame, GDB is going to query debug info D for each source file one at a time as it uh, attempts to, as it uh, realizes that it doesn't have it locally, it will attempt to query the server. So here you can see downloading source file select.c. And as I go up the call stack, it will download whatever source files that it's locking. And, awesome. and that's it. Aaron, uh, thanks for the demo. Uh, the time is up, so we'll have to switch to the other talk. But that was good. Yeah, interesting. And that's all we have. Um, let's see, just a very final state slide. Uh, a URL there has the current status, including all the uh, various servers that are available and the clients that are there and including patches and stuff. And uh, we welcome IRC discussions and of course mailing lists. Um, we'll head over to one of the hack rooms to, to continue the further chatting that people are interested in. And thank you, thank you, thank you for all your time. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron Frank. So we're going to prepare for yeah, the next presentation, uh, teaching GraalVM Dwarfish debugging native Java using GDB with Andrew Din. So uh, the talk is scheduled for 11.15, I guess. So but I, nobody minds if we start one minute earlier. <laughs> I'm happy to wait until on the dot, just in case anybody's coming along. So yes. Can wait for one minute if maybe people need to grab something or go to the restroom mm -hmm. or whatever. We'll start at precisely uh, 8.15 Pacific time. Right, I think that's actually on the dot. So um, yeah. I'll start. I'm Andrew Dean. I'm from Red Hat's Java team. And I'm going to talk to you today about work I've been doing with the GraalVM native image generator for Java. I've been teaching it to talk Dwarfish, or if you're a Tolkien fan, Dwarfish. Um, that's basically allowing it to communicate with GDB. So um, let's start by saying what GraalVM native is. The image generator is a way of taking a Java application that's presented as either a, a suite of class files or library jars containing class files and turning it into a standalone self-contained binary. You don't need to ship a JVM. You don't need to ship all the class files. You just produce a single image that you can executable you can put on your target machine and run. Um, it doesn't have all the capability of a normal dynamic Java runtime. It doesn't allow you to load classes at runtime and dive into them and start executing because it doesn't include an interpreter or a JIT compile. It has a closed world model. All the code has to be there in advance. Is that really Java? Well, um, 
the Open JDK project is actually working on building a very clear, precise definition of what static Java is as opposed to dynamic Java. But it's already out there in the field as part of Oracle's Graal VM suite of tools. It's one of the components. And we also released it at Red Hat. And our Mandrel releases derived from the same project, which we're a member of, uh, just the Graal VM native part. So it, de facto, it is Java. How does it work? Well, you start with your application. It comprises a set of bytecode files, Java bytecode compiled from sources. And the native image generator starts with a main class, and it does what's called a points to analysis. Starting from that main class, the main method, it derives the type closure and the invocation closure of all methods accessible from the main method. And that gives it a suite of classes that it needs to build into a program, a target program. And there's an optimizing compiler that optimizes about minus 03 level, fairly sophisticated optimizing compiler that gives you a binary. Along the way, you may need to link in OpenJDK classes from an OpenJDK release that are part of the JDK runtime, the standard libraries. You may also need to link in static libraries and implement some native callouts to compile C code that implement some of the methods. So there's a, a, a bundling of that stuff into the suite in the analysis. But you can't bundle all of the JDK code in because we don't want to keep the code that's closely tied to libjvm, the dynamic JVM. We really want to have a, an alternative to that that doesn't have all the cost of maintaining all the dynamic state so there's a lightweight virtual machine called Substrate, and the SVM code is implemented as Java classes. And certain points in the JDK runtime, either at the wholesale class level or with individual methods and fields, substitutions are made for code from the SVM implementation, and that gives you a final suite of classes. You've got a choice of initializing some of the static data for the uh, target program at build time or having runtime initialization, but you can define a heap layout for all the static values that will be linked in there. There's also uh, a, a, a new object heap, thread support, garbage collect support, LinkedIn, and you basically build yourself an executable. So that's how that works. What's the problem with debugging that? Well, all that executable code has bit layouts and code layouts that are derived from class files, and GDB doesn't know anything about them. And those classes exist, uh, are compiled by a bytecode compiler from source code that's in jars and in a source.zip in the case of the OpenJDK code. And GDB doesn't know where they come from or how to find them. So we had two stages to the, uh, the, the pipeline here. We assemble all the type information, all the modifications that are made by the substitutions, all the static data layouts, all the code information from those other previous phases and build a generic model. And from that, we can clone dwarf information that we can put in that will describe to GDB how the program operates and how the data is laid out. Um, we also, at build time, assemble sources because they're usually available in the build time. The source.zip for OpenJDK, we can find all the JDK runtime class sources, and the application sources are usually in source jars. It would no good trying to point GDB at them, but we can build a source cache that we, you can upload next to your binary when you want to debug it, and we put information in the dwarf info that references those source files relative to that cache. Now, I say that that's very simple. We just create dwarf info. There's a problem, though. We don't actually have dwarf info for a Java program that GDB can understand. It doesn't know about Java anymore. So what we've done is, we've at the moment, we're faking it. We're providing dwarf info. What would be an equivalent C++ program? And at the moment, we've implemented all the dwarf info layouts and other dwarf layout uh, records for the method part, the code part of the binary. And we're working on the type stuff as a later work. So for every class, we have a compile unit in the info model. Within that, there are sub records for sub programs. We know the class. We know the name, so we can identify methods by name. We know its address range in the text segment, whether it's visible, public, or private. We can actually, um, uh, from the compiler, we can associate particular addresses back to the originating but compiled bytecode that they were do, compiled from. And we could use line information that was available in the class files at build time to map that back to source lines. So we can actually get source file and line maps for, for methods. The compiler conveniently tells us when stack pushes and stack, stack pops occur at certain offsets in the machine code. So we can also build frame information. And the compiler also tracks where it 
it does inlining so if there's a range which is inline code we can relate the addresses in that range some of them back to source files and source lines using the same model so we can build uh, an info model uh, and a brief section a ranges frame line and string sections much the same as you'd see for the method description part of a c plus plus program and it's pretty it, it's enough to fool gdb into thinking yes i've got a c plus plus program and it debugs the java code with what we've got already and this is already in the product that means we can break methods by name or by method name or by file and line and then gdb will find file source files relative to the sources cache that we've built um, and made available it can step line by line into calls and over calls and it will follow the relevant files and the relevant lines in the file as you're debugging and stepping um, it can also do stack backtraces because it knows about the frame layouts and that will include you can see in the stack frame the transition from the c entry point into the java main method and if you break a, a native method that's implemented c you can see where it's called from java it all just works and of course it all works transparently inside emacs which is the most important thing um, what I'm working on now is the next phase is working on putting information about types and the heap layouts into the dwarf model. Now, that the, in order to get the type information in, we have to do a bit more work to fool GDB into thinking it's got a C++ program that will look equivalent to the Java program and will debug properly. And we can get certain capabilities out of that with a fairly basic bit of, uh, of, of trickery. So. Java objects are going to be pointer types to an underlying structure type. The object reference is really just a pointer. The underlying structure will have a header, and it will have field entries for each of the Java data values, like a Java integer, 32-bit signed integer, or an object reference to some other class. So we can describe the class layout for a Java class. When we have subclassing, we can model the underlying structure types of the two, the two classes as though they've represented using a public inheritance. So again, we can just use the standard C++ model for that. A Java interface is basically a, a type that can be implemented by disparate types that don't have a common parent class, we can actually model that out using a union of the pointer types of each of the implementers. So we can get interfaces to sort of work and we can cast to the relevant type and invoke via a, a suitable subtype and so on. Uh, we can also model arrays using another under a reference, a reference to another underlying structure type. It's got a slightly different header structure because the array header has a length in it and it'll have an empty array of elements of either a reference type, which will be an array of pointers or of a Java primitive uh, type like Boolean. Uh, integer float and so on. So we can model arrays as well using whatever the equivalent model for that C plus that C plus plus type would be, and then we can use that to type locations in the heap, to type constant values that are in the heap, and also to type local variables and parameter variables once we can put information about liveness in. So with with that work that I'm currently working on, we should be able to print objects field by field with a header to tag information. We should be able to identify data values using names for parameter vars, names for local vars, names for static locations, and know when they're live and map them to a register or a stack address or a heap address. We should be able to use cast so that we can access elements of a subtype or of an interface type. And we should be able to use path expressions to traverse the object network. So we'll have enough for us to be able to do basic debugging. And it's at this point then we really need to start thinking about how do we get GDB to do this properly? And we stop faking it and do it for real so GDB can understand Java again. So um, coming to the end of that, I'll just say that the code that's working now the, the, the for debugging is in the Graal repo upstream. It's also in our Mandrel repo. My work in progress on putting type information is in, is in my debug types branch in my GitHub repo. There's a lovely YouTube demo, demo on our Quarkus channel, Quarkus is our middleware that relies upon the native image generator, showing me debugging a Java program. It's slightly out of date, but it shows actual debugging and moving around the source file. So have a look at that and have a play with it. And I hope you enjoy that, and I'd be very interested for your feedback. So, any feedback? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Any questions, Frank? Yeah, Andrew, I think I'll be in touch uh, <laughs> offline once we're talking. It looks like we have some, at least more, two fertile opportunities to uh, interface our code, so all good. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great, Frank. Good. Right, stunned silence. I know the word, the mention of Java just uh, <laughs> puts the willies up most people, but it, it's really it's really C++. Just pretend that. It's fine. <laughs> so, Andrew, hi. Hi. 
did you look at the GDB support just before it was removed? The Java support for GCJ? No, I haven't. I haven't looked at it. All I found was that the the, the Java language is still uh, defined, and it immediately says, "Oh, you mean C plus plus," and that's all that's there right now. <laughs> um, I didn't know what was there before. I'm not sure how much it'll translate because it was GCJ support. So maybe things will work. Maybe they won't. I mean, the, the difficult bit is the, the layouts, and I'm not sure they're necessarily going to be comparable or it, it, I suppose in the abstract they are but in the detail they probably won't be but it might be it might be useful to look at that I've just been wanting to get something to work so we can actually have the product be debuggable as soon as possible um, and then we'll think about the longer term retrofitting this and getting GDB there but it's at the stage where it would be good to talk to someone from the GDB team about that so anybody who's working on GDB has got an interest in this I'd be really keen to follow this up one thing that may be useful is the parser because it had a, had a Java parser. Uh -huh. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm hoping I'll get by, you know, path expressions will work very much the same, apart from you're going to have to put, put casts into dereference uh, an interface union, or, or, or you know, but it, it, a lot of it should be sort of transparently work, I think, but that's still yet to be proven. So <laughs> when I get there, I'll let you know. But yes, I mean, there's a lot of cleanup that could be done, and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting it actually done for real rather than just, just um, hacking this in. But this should be very valuable experience once this is working to work out what we really do need. I think we have to call it a day there. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Andrew. Appreciate you. Very good time keeping the exemplars at all. Um, <laughs> practice, your, practice. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you. Your um, moderate, moderator for the afternoon session will be Joel Brobecker, um, who many of you will know. Um, uh, so I shall hand over him to introduce talks and um, uh, keep people to time. And for those who are interested, the notes from the boffs are now up on the uh, uh, with wiki the links in the uh, chat. Okay, over to you, Joe. All right, Vladimir, the floor is yours. Okay, thank Here you, guys. thank you, Joe. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I am Vlad Mekarov, and this presentation will be about uh, my experience to use GCC as a JIT compiler for Ruby and how this experience resulted in starting the lightweight JIT compiler project. About five years ago, the creator of Ruby programming language, uh, Yukihiro Matsumoto, set up three goals for CRuby version 3. These goals are type checking, checking uh, parallelism support and improving CRuby performance in three times in comparison with version two. My personal opinion, uh, successful fulfilling these goals uh, would prevent Go actively eating uh, Ruby market share because Go already has this feature. CRuby virtual machine has uh, very optimized code. Radical three times uh, performance improvement of uh, fine-tuned virtual machine could be achieved only by a radical change uh, as adding JIT. There are a lot of uh, Ruby implementations and some of them with JITs. Some JITs were actually proposed to become part of CRuby. I decided to participate in CRuby JIT work too. Because I am from uh, GCC community, I decided to try to build the GCC-based JIT, which I called MJIT. MJIT simply means a method JIT. When I started this work, uh, David Malcolm already implemented libgcc JIT, a JIT compiler library based on GCC. This diagram shows how CRuby JIT based on libgcc JIT would look like. But after uh, consultation with David, I decided to use a bit different approach. Code executing the Ruby bytecode calls a big set of uh, inline functions. I call this set an environment. Generating uh, the environment through libgcc JIT API is huge error-prone job, and it's a nightmare for maintenance uh, as this set actively changed by other CRuby developers. Also, libgcc JIT cannot inline functions because of its start point in uh, GCC optimization pipeline. 
Instead of uh, libgcc JIT, I decided to use GCC itself. Instead of libgcc JIT API, I use C as interface language. Using such approach makes implementation simple and easy for debugging. It also permits to use alternative C compilers, for example, Clang. The environment is added as a header. To speed up its processing, I actually use a pre-compiled header. Here's the data flow of approaches uses libgcc JIT and GCC itself. The red parts are different. They are basically creating GCC internal representation of the environment and JIT code from C. If we can make runtime of three of these uh, parts uh, small, uh, there will be no performance advantages in using the GCC JIT. A key to achieve uh, the same compile time is pre-compiled headers. Here's the time graph for the compilation data flow for typical Ruby method. As you can see, optimizations and generation take biggest time. Parsing a C function, which implements the bytecode instruction sequence, is very small. Parsing the environment is pretty big, even if we throw away unnecessary environment declarations. But when we use pre-compiled environment, processing the environment drops to 3.5%. So using pre-compiled header basically speeds up JIT compilation in about two times for a typical small Ruby method. So about three years ago, I implemented CRuby JIT, and here are the performance results. Historically, most widely used CRuby programs like Ruby on Rails are input-output bound benchmarks. JIT is mostly useless for them. Ruby community uses opt-caret benchmark for performance measuring. Opt-caret is about 30-second CPU-bound benchmark, a Nindenta Entertainment System Simulator written on Ruby. The speed for this program is measured in frames per second. I used CRuby JIT with GCC and Clang, JRuby with and without support of dynamic languages, Oracle Graal Ruby, and IBM OMR JIT Ruby. GCC LLVM JIT is the second best and improves the CRuby version to performance in uh, three times. Graal results are the best because of aggressive jitting and speculation and in line with Ruby standard methods. To do this successfully, you need a very fast JIT compiler. Here's CPU time. People frequently omit this in JIT comparison, but it's important how many resources you spend to execute a program. This is important for mobile devices using battery and uh, for cloud applications uh, because uh, usage of more CPUs is costly. As you can see, CRuby MJIT and OMR Ruby, uh, only CRuby MJIT and OMR Ruby spend less res CPU resources to execute uh, the benchmark than its interpretation. Peak memory consumption. For MJIT, this includes memory used by GCC LLVM. We need to spend additional memory to generate and keep JIT code. JRuby spent too much memory. No surprise here. People always complain that JVM needs too much memory. But Graal Ruby is even worse. Uh, my MJIT code was adopted by Takashi Kukubun, and the adopted code became official CRuby MJIT since version 2.6. The difference with my original version is in use existing uh, virtual machine stack instructions instead of register instructions I introduced for the JIT. Also, official MJIT has no speculation instructions and speculative code generation and has less aggressive JITing heuristics. But it can combine JITed methods in one shared object. In overall, performance of official, official CRuby JIT is a bit worse. But enough about advantages of uh, GCC LLVM based JITs. 
let us speak about the disadvantages. First of all, GCC LLVM based JITs are big. Their compilation speed can be also slow. And it's hard to implement optimizations of code written on different programming languages. In case of CRuby, they Ruby and C. People are also uncomfortable to have GAS or GCC in production environment needed for libgcc JIT or MJIT. Dynamic loader allocates four kilobyte pages for each object generated with GCC JIT or MJIT. When there are a lot of objects, about 100 bytes each, it results in a lot of TLB misses and big performance hit. So let us consider some of these disadvantages in more detail. First of all, GCC and LVM are big compared to CRuby. How big? CRuby binary is big, but uh, GCC and LVM binaries are much bigger, from 7 to 18 times bigger. Using GCC LVM based JIT for a simple language could easily increase binary code in 100 times. The big code size can be a serious problem for cloud environment, Internet of Things or mobile market environments. Second, GCC LLVM compilation speed is slow. It seems that 20 milliseconds is small for method compilation with GCC LLVM on modern CPUs. But for less powerful but widely used CPUs, it can be a half, a half second. Also, faster speed can help achieving desirable JIT performance by aggressive speculation and inlining. How a faster JIT compilation could look? For Java Falcon compiler, it's about 100 milliseconds for one method for LLVM-based JIT compiler and one millisecond for faster tire one JVM compiler. So why GCC LLVM compilation is slow? GCC has more 300 optimization passes. You can uh, just disable most passes, but will be a speed up proportional to the number of disabled passes. The biggest problem for GCC and LLVM to be a lightweight JIT compiler is a big startup time. For small code, the initialization can take majority of all compilation. And small method code is typical for dynamic higher level languages. So you cannot switch off optimizations and proportionally speed up GCC and Clang. To get a better performance, we need to inline C code implement, implementing standard Ruby methods besides function from the environment. Here's a small example. Ruby code calls method uh, times, which is implemented on C. This C code call calls uh, several times another Ruby code implementing multiplication. How can we integrate all three code parts in one generated function code? Let us consider again the current MG structure. C function, which can be in line, should be in the pre-compiled header. The more code we insert into the header, the slow JIT code generation because of much bigger precompiled header. In brief, my experience with MJIT shows that GCC client can be excellent tier two compilers, but they cannot be a tier one compiler. Tier one compiler should be much faster and smaller. Its performance is less important, especially for dynamic languages, where implementing inlining and aggressive speculation is more important for performance than classical compiler optimizations. JIT compiler should uh, generate code directly in memory. LLVM MC JIT can do this. Unfortunately, it's not true for libgcc JIT and GCC. GCC needs embedded assembler and loader. libgcc JIT needs, uh, needs a streamable input language, not only API. The language should be uh, very quickly compiled, readable, and desirably of high level, ideally of C language level. So after MJIT implementation, I believe CRuby needs a lightweight JIT compiler. The lightweight JIT compiler should be an addition to existing MJIT generating C code 
or the on rigid compiler where the current one does not work. So about two years ago, I started to work on a lightweight JIT compiler initially in my spare time. And later, I started to spend half of my work time on this project. Because I'd like to use JIT compiler not only for Ruby. I decided to make it a universal JIT compiler and a standalone project. The central notion of the project is well-defined intermediate language called MIR. MIR is strongly typed and flexible enough. MIR in different forms can represent machine code for CISC and RISC processors. To get a better understanding of what is MIR, uh, let us consider a retrospect CIF code as an example. Here is a C code for CIF. And here is MIR uh, textual representation for the same code. There are no hard registers in MIR, only typed variables. Call ABI is also hidden. First operand in the func pseudo instruction is function return type, and then all arguments are declared. Local variables are declared as 64 bit integers through local pseudo instruction. I set up some performance goals for the JIT compiler. Comparing to GCC, it should have a 100 times faster compilation, 100 times faster startup, and 100 times smaller code size. As for the, the generated code performance, I decided uh, it should be at least 70% comparing to GCC with minus two. It should be simple too, less than 10,000 C lines because I want a wider adoption of it. I'd like to avoid, avoid any external dependency for this project too. I will talk later about what's the actual results I have now. How to achieve the performance goals? Optimizing compilers like GCC are big and complex because they are trying to improve any code, including rare edge cases. They practically they use practically any known optimization a lot of complicated code data structures to effectively compile functions of any size. So to achieve our goals, we need to use few most valuable optimizations. Optimize only frequent cases and use algorithms with the best combination of simplicity and performance. So what are the most valuable optimizations? The most important optimizations are only effectively exploiting, uh, 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 once effectively exploiting most common uh, CPU resources, instruction set and registers. So the most valuable optimizations are a good register allocation and code selection. Some time ago, I did an experiment switching on only a fast and simple register allocator and combiner in GCC. Comparing to hundreds of optimizations in GCC with minus O2, these two optimizations achieve almost 80% performance on spec in 2000. Here's the diagram showing the current state of uh, the lightweight JIT project. Currently, I can create MIR through API or from MIR textual or binary representation. MIR binary representation is three times more compact and four times faster the, to read than the textual one. I can interpret MIR code and generate machine code in memory for, for, from MIR for two different targets. There are no any external dependencies besides standard C library. I can generate C code from MIR and I am also working on uh, C to MIR compilers by implementing LLVM to MIR and my own C compiler. Here's the diagram showing the possible development directions of the project. Generating MIR from LLVM internal representation opens uh, use of code on different languages implemented with LLVM. Generating MIR from Java bytecode would do the same for languages implemented with JVM. Generating web assembly from MIR could help to use MIR code in web browsers. There will be a lot of interesting possibilities if even 
a part of these directions I implemented. The most interesting component, at least for me, is smear generator. It can work on different optimization levels. There is very, a very fast generation part without building control flow graph and any data flow analysis. The generator also implements linear scan register allocator and code selector as the most valuable optimizations. Sparse conditional constant propagation and common sum expression elimination will be important for inline functions in CRUBY environment. Register renaming is for improving register allocation. I also implemented register pressure sensitive loop invariant uh, motion, but probably I remove it in the future as it has small value for my purposes. I started with only register allocator and combiner. Therefore, I did not use SSA. Then I added few optimization later not using SSA. I think it was a mistake. Uh, now I'm planning to use conventional SSA in the future. Also, I don't generate position independent code. Generating such code is more complicated and decreases performance. To start usage of MIR in Ruby, I need C to MIR compiler. There are several ways uh, to implement it. It could implement, I could implement uh, LLVM IR to MIR compiler or write GCC port to MIR, but it would create a big dependence to a particular external project for Ruby. On the other hand, some people uh, wrote small C compilers pretty quickly. So I decided to write own C compiler to MIR first. It should implement standard C11 without optional variable arrays, complex, and atomics. My approach to the C compiler implementation is classic division on four, on four passes of approximately the same size. MIR to C compiler is mostly done. It passes about 1,000 small tests and successfully bootstrap itself. It can be used as a library, and there is a driver to use it from command line. And finally, the current performance uh, uh, results for MIR generator and interpreter comparing to GCC. I used the CIF benchmark, which consists of only 30 preprocessed lines. Compilation speed of MIR generator is about 300 times faster than GCC with minus two. It takes only 50 microseconds to generate code for CIF. And CIF code, CIF code uh, generated by MIR generator is only 5% slow. MIR generator object size is much, much smaller than GCC. MIR generator has a very fast startup time and suitable for tire widget, tire one uh, JIT compiler. Here's source uh, line distribution for the current state of MIR project. The MIR core and MIR 2C compiler are about uh, 10, 12,000 lines each. MIR generator is a bit more than 6,000 lines. Machine dependent code used by generator is about two, 3,000 lines for each target. Uh, porting MIR uh, to a new target takes about uh, one, two months for me. Uh, sorry, uh, I have no time for this slide, so I am skipping it. Uh, but uh, this slide maybe uh, will, will be useful for people later if they want to compare uh, my MIR uh, project with other JIT compiler projects. About the future plans, MIR is already used in several language implementations, and people are asking me to make a first release of it. So I am planning to do this at the end of this year. I'd like to have a prototype uh, MRuby JIT compiler based on MIR in one year. I'm sure working on it will affect uh, the future MIR. 
If you are interested, you can find the source on GitHub. Here's uh, the link. And that's it for today. Thank you for, for your attention. And uh, I'm ready to answer questions if you have some. Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, we have a few more minutes uh, for questions. David. Hello. Uh, Eva. Um, I, I, is there a limit there in existence that I, I guess my obvious uh, thing to do is to input mere IR and then spew it into a libgcc JIT context, which might be a way of getting a kind of a tier two uh, JIT compiler um, for free, air quotes, uh, from there. Um, that might be a thing I might try to, like to try hacking on. Yeah, you are right, actually. I'm, cons I'm considering um, uh, to in the future to make uh, GCC uh, port to MIR and uh, uh, make a MIR as input uh, to GCC, probably to LibGCC JIT. So people using LibGCC JIT could uh, also use uh, MIR for this. But my experience actually MIR is uh, a pretty low level too, although it's called medium internal representation, but people prefer to use something even uh, uh, more high level language. For example, uh, people uh, asking me to use uh, even my c 2 mir compiler as input language uh, for their JITs. Uh, there are, I should say there are several implementations of um, uh, languages uh, with MIR already, although there are no, there is no uh, first release. And uh, one interesting project is uh, called Ravi. They are trying to use uh, every possible JIT to implement uh, this language. It's it's kind of a Lua dialect with static typing. So it's interesting to compare performance uh, uh, MIR with other uh, uh, JIT compilers. And uh, I got feedback, for example, that OM IBM OMR JIT and uh, my uh, MIR uh, JIT compiler is practically the same with performance point of view. I guess it's so. I don't know if there's anybody else out there that is uh, pondering using GCC as a JIT, but um, I know you were dragged into the conversation with Ruby and the GCC JIT uh, about uh, six months to a year ago, Vlad, where uh, the Ruby project was using GCC as a JIT and it was using uh, pre compiled headers. Does that yeah. sound familiar? And yeah, anything yeah, using TCH in a world where uh, we have PI executables and address space layout randomization is doomed to failure. And I think the, the, the takeaway from that is the startup time for GCC makes it infeasible as a JIT. And so I, I would be very hesitant to suggest anybody go off and use GCC as a JIT engine because of that. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. But uh, my uh, understanding, we should fix uh, pre-compiled headers and make it uh, working for uh, page randomizations, because uh, yeah, we just had to it, rewrite it. Yeah, yeah, they they, they used uh, uh, not only uh, by me, but for example, I know Virtual Box uses uh, uh, pre-compiled headers very actively, and if it's broken. It's not good because for Clank, uh, pre-compiled headers works uh, very well with uh, randomization, uh, with page randomizations. Yep. Well, they do it right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They they have a real streamable language. It's very compact in comparison pre-compiled headers with GCC. Uh, 
of GCC. GCC is simply a hack. They just dump memory, and that's it. Yep. Jeff, would you like to ask uh, some questions? Oh, that was me talking with Vlad just a moment ago. Oh, OK. I, sorry. No worries, Joel. Hey, Vlad. This is David. Really, really interesting work, really great work on this. I was curious if you thought about this in terms of like a Cython interface as opposed to a JIT. In other words, using GCC for to compile in a um, less immediate way, where the startup time again with Cython for you know, compiling Cython code isn't uh, isn't critical. Yeah, it would be interesting to use it for other dynamic languages, and uh, uh, Cython or Python could be. Uh, Interesting uh, for this, but no, no, I, I didn't mean using it for Cython. I meant you instead of having this C Ruby as a JIT, mm -hmm. where it's immediate, have C Ruby behave like C Cython. Mm. Yeah, the way a lot of uh, different uh, attempts to implement uh, C Ruby JITs, and I'm sure somebody already tried this. For example. Uh, uh, C Ruby. Uh, uh, some people try to use uh, j j uh, JavaScript and all this stuff, but it didn't work. Uh, so I, I don't know. I don't know how. Uh, my approach is to use uh, Mir project for uh, implementing uh, C Ruby and M Ruby JIT. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you, everyone, for your questions as well and your interest. I'm sorry, we're running out of time, so we need to set up for the next one. And the next presentation is an update on Project Ranger from Andrew and Aldi. Andrew, if you want to start video. Andrew? I'm trying. It was working a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> Didi, and it doesn't seem to want to let me at the moment. This all worked not long ago. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay. All right. There, am I showing up? Uh, almost, Andrew. Andrew, and I'm just gonna make you presenter, Andrew. All right. It's not sure what I look nope. like. Sorry. Wrong one. Sorry. Here we go. So, Andrew, you should have uh, presenting uh, rights. So, the floor is yours. Have a good presentation. Okay. Thank you. For some reason, I can't see my own video. So, hopefully, I'm sort of centered here. Um, all right. So, I'm just going to give you a quick a quick update on Ranger Project, which uh, we introduced last year at the Tools Cauldron. Um, so. Today, what I'm planning to do is I'm just going to give a. No, I'm not sure everybody had attended that, so I'll give you a very quick update, maybe five minutes on what the Ranger project is. Um, then I'll give a brief rundown on what's changed since then, what we're planning to do in stage one, and and beyond after that. Um, all right. And by the way, if anyone has any questions, feel free to interrupt me at any point through this. Um, so the Ranger project itself is. Uh, was created in order to um, generate much more accurate ranges with a very lightweight infrastructure. And in order to do that, uh, we needed to provide, we, we provide basically three things. Uh, one is the range ops, which uh, teaches, um, teaches the compiler how to perform operations on ranges for all the different tree codes. So how to, how to add ranges, how to subtract ranges, stuff like that. Um, then we support the original range um, classes supported just like a pair of in, a pair of values for ranges and we're providing uh, much more accuracy so multiple sub ranges and then the ranger infrastructure itself um, does queries for ranges walks the cfg puts all the information together and does it in an on-demand way so you don't need to walk through the entire program in order to ask a question at some point you can just ask the question and it'll go figure it all out 
Um, so the range ops part, uh, like I had mentioned, solves problems for each individual op code, but it, it's actually an equation solver. It's not just a folder. Like um, the way we currently do things, you could fold a plus and get a result. Um, now, if we know what the left-hand side is and we know one of the other operands, it'll solve for the other. Um, and that allows us to do a lot of interesting things. Um, in particular, we uh, we can work backwards. So when you get an if at the bottom of a uh, at the bottom of an expression, the left if you take in the true side, the left hand side of that if is actually a one uh, a true, and so you can solve for um, you can solve for the if in the example that's there. Um, you can solve for x. And then you can keep feeding that back, and so you can step back through the program, and that—that's how—that's why we don't have to walk all the way through the program from the top to the bottom. We can just walk back as far as we need to, and frequently you don't have to walk back very far to get the answers to the questions you're looking for. Um, this aspect we managed we managed to get into trunk last year before stage one cut off. Um, so EVRP and VRP and all the current range um, infrastructure uses range ops under the covers to 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 do the folding. We don't utilize any of the uh, equation solving parts yet. That's that'll come out online with the Ranger. Um, the uh, implementation of multiple sub ranges. Uh, it's basically um, non overlapping integral sub ranges uh, with an arbitrary number of them to represent the range. Um, I don't know if I need to say much else about that right now. It's just it's just an alternate representation. Um, when I get to what's in going into trunk right now, I'll give you a little bit more information about that. Um, and then there's the Ranger itself. Uh, we basically boil everything down to one of one of five questions, and for most optimizations, the first three are all they really need to do. You can ask at any given point in the program. You can point to an operand and say, "What's the range right here at this point?" Um, you can ask what the result of this statement is. So you can ask what the left-hand side is of any given statement. And you can also ask on an incoming edge, what's the range on this edge? Um, and that seems to actually cover just about everything we ever really need. Uh, okay, so that's it for the quick summary. Um, of for the statement, article. for the expression, the first one, uh, is it before the statement or after? It's it's before the statement is executed, so it's the incoming okay. values to the statement, and range of statement is the outgoing values, basically. So those are your three situations. Uh, da -da -da -da. So the ranger is uh, what's my next slide? Okay. So and the ranger, I mean, we, we, it's been operating on the branch for a long time. We've done a lot of tweaks and stuff, and we're. I had I said I hoped that we were going to have it into trunk by the time this conference started, but it looks like we're probably going to be a week or two. We're uh, working on some performance issues right now that have cropped up since last year, but for the most part, um, I'm expecting we'll be ready to submit it in the next couple of weeks. So significant changes since last year. Um, we've done a lot. We did a lot of work during the off season. Um, our multiple sub range uh, code used to be completely separate from the existing code we and we've managed to integrate those together so that they're now one thing i'll go over that in a minute um since it's actually of more relevant detail importance i mean um we've had an a number of refinements to the range ops code itself the code base in order to integrate well, with VRP and stuff, we've done a lot of work to make sure that we do we produce the exact same results that the code used to. Um, it's all been shuffled off into the range ops infrastructure now. So uh, we've made a lot of refinements to that. And as we as we find various issues, mo the the goal is, especially going forward, is when we have a missed optimization or something, um, we should only have to teach range ops what what's missing. Like if uh, um, we can teach the right shift optimization or the, the code for folding right shift uh, for certain cases. Um, anyway, I'm getting I'm 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 going down a path I don't really want to go down. So basically, the idea is we're going to be able to fix an awful lot of PRs by just tweaking the range ops code, and we've been doing a lot of that, and we've got a lot more of that to do. 
Um, there's been a lot of internal restructuring to the Ranger code. Um, it's now a lot flatter and a lot cleaner than it used to be. Um, that's not really relevant to most people, but we've done a lot of work on that. Um, we're we're producing. We used to have our own pass. So, short-term goal is we want to replace the early VRP pass, and then the long-term goal is we're going to replace all of the VRP pass with the Ranger. Um, as of last year, we had our own pass for doing range um, for doing a VRP pass. Uh, we've since integrated with the substitute and fold engines and everything, so we're using exact same mechanism as EVRP is at the moment. This is mostly for a compatibility thing during this transition stage. Um, but So we've done a lot of consolidating between the Ranger and both of the VRPs so that we get as much common code as possible. Um, and the other significant change is we now have a, or I have a prototype for handling relational queries. Uh, that's another thing that VRP currently does that isn't really range uh, specific like you can have a set of ranges, but if you say, you know, if A is equal to Y, and then later on you say if A equals not equal to Y, in order to fold that condition, you can't use ranges for that, but it's a relational thing. Um, so we've got a, I've got a prototype done for uh, tracking relationals at the same time so that we can do, solve a lot of it. That was one of the big missing pieces. Um, it's not quite ready for prime time. It's been prototyped, and over the next couple of months, I'm hoping to have that actually in and done too. Um, let's see, so the chain, the main change to iRange is we, we used to represent it as a, as a list of pairs of wide ints. We switched move, we've since switched to using trees internally instead, and that has allowed us to actually merge with value, with value range. Um, our API hasn't really changed. We still, we still query and get uh, wide ints back because we don't want to deal with only integers. Um, but it's give, but what we now have is a, a compatibility layer in that if you ask for a an I range that only has a single pair, it goes into legacy mode, which allows it to work exactly the same way as value range. Um, so now the two coexist. You can copy a multi range into a value range and a value range back to a multi range. You lose precision, but it all works. Everything everything kind of works together. So now um, we really we really have much more common code now that we can do that. Um, Aldi has created a, a porting document was, as he went through and sort of ported everything. Um, I don't think he's published it yet, but it should be in the next week or two. Certainly by the time Ranger comes out, we'll have the, uh, the porting guidelines document available. Um, so I'll give a quick rundown on relations and how they're going to work. Um, there's a class that tracks individual relations. So when you see um, any any uh, the 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 six different kinds of relations, or actually seven when you include no relation, so that when we um, anytime as we uh, we can represent them as an abstract thing, and then we can start combining them. So if you've got you know x2 is less than b6 on one branch and a2 is equal to six here and you combine those two things together um, you can you can determine the results um, it helped that it's by combining these in a general way that we'll be able to answer questions um, that will allow us to fold conditions that allow us to uh, map equivalencies so that if we ask for the range of one thing and it's equivalent to something else we can give you the range of both combined um, and so it's it's basically a um, a simple object that we can then use and combine in whatever ways we see fit. Um, there's the next slide. And the relational stuff follows the same model we use for range ops. Uh, it's not currently integrated with range ops because as as it's evolving, uh, I was trying not to mess up the range ops interface until we actually have whatever the final version is going to be. But basically it allows you to query for the relation between the left hand side and any operand or between the two operands. And so this this allows us to generically treat all of the different tree codes uh, the same and the same idea will apply. Once, once the infrastructure is all in working, if we're missing a case somewhere, we'll probably be able to get it by um, teaching the op code, the, the the range ops, but what the relation is. Um, so for example, if X1 is less than B2, that's a pretty simple thing to track the relation for. But um, 
in the example here for uh, for an assignment. There are relations between the left-hand side and the operand, and it depends on the type. And if you happen to have ranges for it, you can then um, get much more specific information. So, for instance, in that addition, if it's a if it's an unsigned integer, um, there is no relation between x2 and b3 because you don't know if it's going to be less than or greater than. But if you happen to know the range of x2 or x3, or sorry, x2 or b3, then you can actually determine you know, that there is a relation between the two, and then that can help you fold stuff away later on. I'm going over this very quickly. I don't have much time, but it'll be much more interesting when it actually comes out, because then I'll publish the whole document on how it works and all that kind of stuff. Um, and this is just an example of how you can, if you happen to know, so when we see x2 less than or equal to 5, the range of configured a range for x2, when you, when you go take back step, you can calculate a range for B3 using range outs, but you can also calculate a relation. And if you then wanted to uh, apply that relation later on, we would know that X2 is less than B3 or or whatever the cases are in those those three places. Um, what am I doing here? Do, do, do. And the queries in the relational engine, um, it basically op operates as an oracle. Uh, we track equivalency C separately from all the other relations because you, you, you satisfy the equivalencies first, which may give you a set of things, and then you apply the relations from all of those things. Um, as at the way it currently works, we require the dominators. So since we're integrated with um, the EVRP and the dominator walk stuff, um, I'm just piggybacking on that right now. Um, so as you walk through the block, statements are registered, um, and we register the relations and and track those, and then we can query them later. Uh, the long-term plan is to integrate this much more tightly with the on-demand model of the ranger. So we will still register statements as we see them, but only as the ranger sees them as it walks back and does just what it needs to do. Um, that's the long-term plan for that. Um, the API for it's still pretty simple. You can ask for a you can ask really all you can do right all it can do right now is uh, you can ask for the equivalency set for something or you can actually try applying relations to a statement. That's how it currently goes and and folds. Uh, I expect to actually open up a bit more of that so because there are other more useful things. I suspect that this will actually be of use in places other than the Ranger, um, which is why I'm trying to keep it sort of separate. Uh, I think the Oracle would, would have much more use, would have other uses in other places as well. So that's all of the uh, the new stuff we got. Um, currently in stage one, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, range ops was integrated in the last release of GCC. The multi-range support for iRange, um, I think I'll check that in in July. Uh, it's in there running. We did a lot of performance work on it, and we've actually got to the point where in a lot of cases, the multi-range code runs, um, it's actually a little bit faster than the legacy code in some cases, uh, but in general, it was pretty much a wash all the way through. So we've got multi-range support and the legacy stuff. If we ever get to the point where we manage to get rid of all of the legacy code and value range that doesn't need it anymore, then we can drop all the legacy support pretty straightforward and everything will speed up a little bit because there'll be a lot less checks for stuff. Um, as I mentioned, we're going through the final performance runs of the Ranger. Um, the conversion to trees cost us a little bit. The move over to the folder and substitute engine, um, that's cost us some bit too because it doesn't understand the concept of asking for ranges on edges or anything, so we have to we have some adjustments to make. But I think we've got it under control at the moment. I'm hoping that in the next couple of weeks uh, we'll be able to submit it to Trunk, uh, along with the passes we had talked about last year that are sp sped up by using it. And I've also implemented a new version of VR VRP where um, it can run in multiple modes, but the general idea is it runs exactly the way it does today and it runs EVRP and Ranger both. So it'll query one, and if it can fold it, it will fold it. If um, if it fails to fold with EVRP, then it'll call the Ranger and say, can you fold this or do something with it? With And we can run it in different ways. We can run, it, run Ranger first and EVRP, EVRP second, which will then show us which things EVRP, EVRP is getting that we don't. If we do it the other way, um, 
you run EVRP first and then the Ranger, then it shows you the things the Ranger gets that EVRP wouldn't. And then they can also run in solo modes and there's a tracing mode which shows you lots of interesting stuff. Um, so that would all be part of the submission when we come forward in a couple of weeks. And then the relational Oracle, I hope to have that kind of up and running by early October. So hopefully we can get that in too and all the performance in that of course will be great, I hope. <laughs> All right, um, so that's what we're planning to do for the stage one. Then, there we go. Once once we're in and operating, um, the plan is we will start identifying, we'll run it in the mode where the Ranger goes first and EVRP goes second, and it, flag, it will flag everything that EVRP gets that we don't, and we will work on determining why it's getting something we're not and fixing that. Once it reaches the point where um, EVRP isn't getting anything or is only getting things that are got by other passes later on because of something that was exposed, then we can replace EVRP with just the Ranger. Um, and then the goal, the next goal after that will be then to, to look at the iterative VRP pass and see what it's getting that we're not because the Ranger includes um, iterative updating, which is the main thing that the, that the the VRP pass provides and in theory there isn't I can't think of anything that VRP gets that we shouldn't but I'm sure there's a little bit of footwork to do uh, and then we'll just have a single VRP for everywhere that and should be significantly faster too I hope um, VRP tends to be uh, uh, a bunch of a bunch of optimizations that are lumped together to make use of range information. If we can make range information cheap enough, we can push these things back out to the passes where they belong instead of trying to lump them into VRP. Um, the range ops code still has some enhancements for multi-range because we just base some of some things like multiply and add, they're all very multi-range um, enabled now, but a lot of the other um, things like shift, the shifts and a lot of the other things, we basically just absorb the old code, which is, um, uh, single range based and there's we, we've identified at least a half a dozen um, PRs we can fix by simply teaching range ops how to be multi-range to handle the cases that are in there because typically it's a small sub range of stuff that currently those operations just don't work on multi-range um, block outgoing range refinements oh, so there's a there's a speed up for the ranger uh, it currently, when you when you, when it does those little backward queries to answer questions, it does a lot more work than it has to. Um, I have some optimizations for that that will be combined with the so we can I'll be able to do the relational and 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 uh, range related stuff sort of simultaneously and cache it and it'll just speed things up even more than they already are, uh, which is part of the tighter integration. Um, Long-term plans also involve allowing more than just integral ranges. Um, I've had some queries about floating point ranges, which we can we can take care of as well eventually. Um, that includes tracking, you know, not a numbers and a lot of different conditions. Um, we've had some input on what that would look like. It requires some adjustments to the range base. We need to may have a we need to have, we need to do a few adjustments, but the Ranger itself is not integral based. It's just we just need to do some uh, tweaking to allow for a class other than I range. And uh, we don't do any bit mass tracking. Um, that would fit in with range ops, and there's some pretty pretty interesting things we could do with that too. I think. Um, doo -doo -doo. And uh, oh, that's that's the end of my slides. So I'm open to whatever questions or comments you have. Yeah, Andrew, this is Jeff. Um, just one note, you mentioned that uh, you have an iterative step in Ranger. That is different than the VRP iteration that we're trying to get rid of. <clears throat> yes. Correct. Yes. So what the iterative part of the Ranger is, is when you ask for when you ask for the range of an SSA name, um, it doesn't walk back to the CFG looking for the definition. And it doesn't need dominators or anything. It just does a. It just it does a walk. And sometimes when it finds a back edge, it'll keep looking through the back edge till it gets back to where it started. Um, so it doesn't go anything. It's 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 purely linear. Like there's no. It doesn't. Yes. It only, it'll it, it will never visit a block more than once. And 
it will solve some of those, a lot of those back edge problems, um, but it doesn't try to fully solve them. If it ends up in a situation that would be a cycle, it stops. Um, and then that would be an enhancement later on to actually say, hey, we've got a new, the, the infrastructure is there to say, hey, I've got a new value from something you calculated earlier, go find me a new one. Um, but yes, it is not even, it's not, there's, there's, it's a very short cycle. Um, and yes, so it's not the same as the iterative. It just, it just allows us to find values on back edges with, uh, with a minimal amount of effort. In fact, it can find right, a lot. So it's not a, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not that you have to pre-compute everything and then propagate yeah. it through. Yeah, it's, it's not like that. It's, it's part of the cache filling. Uh, for the, so the Ranger has an, an on-entry cache for each basic block. And it will only do, it only deals with one SSA name at a time. So it only has to, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a very heavyweight thing, but it allows us to like, it, it can find half this, anything with constant bounds in a loop, it can find loop bounds, like with a, just a quick check of the, uh, the exit condition, if it's properly written. Which is why I think oh, we'll be able to like, repeat. And so this is, should be available for anybody that uses ranges in the compiler. It's just something we should be able to easily query in starting in a couple of weeks. The more people to query it, the better it'll get. Are there any parameters or something similar to limit how, how far does it look? Uh, in, in um, perhaps for, for uses in other passes, not not in the EVRP where so, we. So no, it doesn't. It doesn't really have limits, but the limits are sort of self-imposed. So if you ask for the range of something, um, it will compute everything it needs to get to that. But so when we did the original the original pass, um, we set it up so that we could run it, do the queries. We do if you do. Um, a dominator walk and ask for the query at every given statement. Um, it doesn't have very much work to do because you've already visited the statement. So when you're asking for the range or something, it knows it. We tried doing that in reverse. Uh, we tried doing it for from basic block two to to the end, and then we did it from the end back. And the times are all very similar in all of them. Uh, so it doesn't really matter what order you do it in. It and it only looks the, the nice part about if you're asking for it in the middle of a program. Um, if it can look back five statements and find the answer, that, that's all it does. It doesn't have to go any further than that. And it will only go as far as it needs to. Um, it, see, it's, it's, it seems quite good. Well, uh, I was wondering about pathological cases, like asking somewhere at, at the end of, of a block with yep. a hundred of thousands state of statements, yep. which each depend on, on the yep. previous one. Um, it only visits each statement once, so it doesn't become pathological. Like when it walks back, it walks back and then comes and it's got its answer. So we haven't found a pathological case. Uh, I know LLVM originally had a pass that did something like this and they had a lot of pathological case issues. Um, I got a couple of them, uh, none of them were an issue. We haven't found anything that's pathological yet. So. I'm hoping the design has actually eliminated that because it is limited. The iterative part is very limited in what it does. Um, and um, the rest of it, it only ever visits a statement once. So there's a limit to the pathologicalness there can be. Hmm. We have a couple more minutes for questions. If anyone would like to ask questions. Or I can do a little tap dance. <laughs> the only uh, thing I'll add is from the original, oops, sorry. No, no, go ahead, please. I say from the original presentation, we had some of our performance numbers, uh, in particular passes that so in order to get ranges before you had to in, in, you had to do a whole dominator walk, which hauled in a bunch of uh, a bunch of access um, infrastructure. Uh, some of those the passes that 
had to do that when we converted them to ranger like i think it was it was a printf pass or or maybe it was a allocate it was one they they really only needed a couple of ranges and those ranges are usually located pretty close though on those passes we were getting like a 95 percent speed up in the pass because we were doing very little work now and you weren't doing a lot of things you didn't need to do so i think there's a lot of potential speed ups can happen with this Yeah, that's one of the, the design principles that looks really, really promising in that we have passes that want to make queries, but they only need a very small subset of objects they want to make queries on. The way e EVRP is structured, we essentially have to look at everything, whereas in the Ranger VRP, it's an on-demand uh, minimal set. It's only the set that actually feeds into the uh, definition of the SSA name that we care about. Yeah. And so passes like the printf pass, the allocate pass, or the uh, out of bounds uh, array indexing pass, I think we'll be able to do very fast analysis uh, on those, which will be awesome. I mean, as, as you know, Andrew, the it was you know the thing that started all this was getting good ranges for the array bounds checking. Yeah, and uh, using it now is where it's going to be really really useful. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I just poking around. I mean, Aldi just finished converting. Uh, we tried to generalize all of the substitution and folding stuff in the last week or so, and uh, I was noticing even, like, even loop versioning. I mean, it seems to do. It seems to have to do an entire walk and calculate ranges for every statement in order to do something. It does a, anyway. There, there's a there was a whole bunch of um, places where I think we can speed stuff up. Yep. And Thank most you. of the dominator paths might be able to go away. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much for all this presentation. Thank you, thank, thank you also to Aldi, who wasn't here today. Uh, thank you for not being here, Aldi. Yeah. And then we'll switch to the next uh, presentation. So, Jose, if you want to come online. The next presentation will be about GNU Poke. It's an update, uh, a 2020 update, about all the exciting work that uh, Jose and maybe others have been doing on GNU Poke. And while Jose comes online, uh, I think uh, there's been some uh, requests for the tag dance. So, Andrew, you can uh, take one of the uh, hacker rooms for your demonstration, of course. Hey, Jose. Hi. So, okay. is, the sound, is the sound OK? It's not too strong? No, it no. sounds perfect to me. OK. So, the slides, OK, they look good. I found out this morning that this BBB platform has some problems with some slides generated from uh, with LaTeX, but it seems to work. Okay, I would like to use those first few minutes to make sure that the screen sharing is working properly. Mm. Is that working? Okay, um, I just tried to use a very a quite fat font in the terminal, so it should be okay, perfect. What I don't Jose, think, can you, yes, can you make the me? font bigger, Jose? Can you make the font a bit bigger? A bit big, right? I guess so. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Zoom. The, the str yeah, the streaming doesn't um, doesn't necessarily do small fonts terribly well. Ah, well, what a shame. Is this good enough? Uh, uh, it's good enough for if you've got a decent broadband and and screen. It might be a bit difficult for people watching on YouTube. Mm. Okay. Well. I mean, now it's quite big, you know. If I continue zooming in, I won't be able to to have enough screen room here. Well, maybe yes. Let's see. Okay. Well, I guess we will have to work with this. Mm hmm Okay. 
So now how to... Yeah. Okay, Jose, you're good to go. Okay. So, um, thank you, Joel. As Joel said, um, this year I wanted to um, to go through some of the the latest developments that we have done in the POC project. Um, it's been more than half a year now since last year, this la last September, when I basically um, um, published the first version of POC, which was in, under development. And uh, well, we have been very, very, very busy uh, during those months. And uh, we have been uh, adding a lot of new support uh, and, you know, like capabilities uh, to POC. And also we have advanced in the design of uh, the language. And there are still some words there, you know, I'm talking about the design, um, like the language capabilities and, you know, like putting everything together. And well, I will be mentioning that in some detail later. So basically, um, this is in the schedule listed as a tutorial. I have to confess that the only reason why I selected that option was because it was the only one giving me more than 20 minutes. But um, in my defense, I have to say that uh, there is going to be a lot of interactive, well, not interactive, like live action here, right? But we don't have much, uh, much time, so we better get started. Okay, next. Well, this is a very similar disclaimer that they used last year in the different conferences where I introduced POC to, to the people. Um, this is a still work in progress. It was work in progress last year. It is work in progress now. Um, as I said, we are um, still working a lot on it. A lot uh, on it. We have not released a first version yet, but we plan to do so like at the if, okay, you know, like uh, late summer. Let's see if that is if that works. Hopefully, it will. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I cannot see my slides. <laughs> Can you see them? Oh, it's just a slow. Okay, well. So, basically today we are going to, first I'm gonna do a very fast and furious introduction to the program, um, mainly for the benefit of the people who, mm, well, they may not, not, uh, not know what uh, POKE is, and I plan to do it like in 10 minutes. It's gonna be fast, I will show you know, what is that for and how to use it and so on. And then we will go through a list of different new uh, stuff and new capabilities that have been have been implemented in the, late, in the last months in the program. And then finally, well, uh, we will take a look to the status of the project and uh, the, the plans for the near future and for the far future as well. Okay, so um, yes, I'm reusing some of the same slides than last year, but only for this first part. Um, basically, what is POC? POC is a command line editor, which, by the way, we will see later that, mm, mm, well, we are already working on adding some other kind of interfaces to it, like graphical user interfaces, but it's mainly um, command line editor for editing structure binary data. What do that means? Well, basically, um, it's like, well, your guardian variety um, binary editor, right? Like you can edit like bytes, bits, uh, you know, like data structures, simple ones, strings, and so on. But also, um, well, basically, POC allows you to define the structure of the data that you um, that you want to edit, that you want to manipulate, in abstract terms. Basically, uh, to put it uh, simple, um, well, imagine that you have some data structure in some uh, binary stream or a binary file. Well, with POC, you can basically define the structure of that data 
and then operate on that data using uh, in terms of the same abstractions that uh, you define. And this is achievable, this is possible without basically without specializing the tool. I mean, POKE is a general purpose tool. And once you teach POKE about the structure of the, your data, you can use it in a quite general way. We will, so we will see that. Um, well, basically, the motivation for the project was that um, in my job, in my daily job, well, I, I have to deal with binary objects um, very often another kind of uh, data which is encoded in not that convenient ways and um, and well um, you know I mean I collected uh, through time I collected like a good good uh, big collection of scripts you know to do all kind of, of things to those files and then at some point I decided that it was enough and that uh, Instead of investing my time on maintaining those scripts, I will invest my time on writing something more general. So, okay. Mm. Basically, well, I took a while to develop the idea. Initially, I thought it was, it was going to be something very simple, like okay, yeah, some C kind, some kind of you know, like C structs with a little bit extra, you know, to eliminate the the undefined um, aspects of the C definitions of structs but then of course it's very fast you know it exploded into 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 craziness and uh, there were some existing work from which I took a lot of inspiration from I can I want to mention one of it which is a data script uh, developed by a um, professor in some American University at the beginning of the 2000s um, which was quite nice. Um, I learned a lot from it, um, but well, it was a bit limited for what I wanted to do. So uh, first, uh, before seeing the architecture, let me show you very, very fast a little poke session for the people who are not familiar with the program. Yeah, okay. So um, I have a built poke here. Um, I'm not cheating. I mean, this is, you see, this is master. Only bootstrap.com is modified because I have I had to use a machine that is not my main machine. But, uh, you know, what we are going to see here is the current uh, master, uh, uh, the, the, the current Git master. So let's see how many segmentation scope faults we are, we are, going, we are going to collect today. So, poke. Mm. Uh, this is how you well how you invoke it when it's not installed. You know this run script it basically sets up the environment, and this is it. You basically you run it, you get a prompt. Um, it says hello, and then you are on your own, right? So. Um, at one of the most basic capabilities is, uh, well, opening what? Opening files, right? We will see later what we call I.O. spaces. So, for example, let's open an object file that they have compiled before here. So, basically, you please ignore the ELF part uh, before the prompt for the moment. Um, so, basically, now the current file in the editor is, is full.o. So then, then uh, what is the most basic thing we can do with it? Well, we can take a look the different uh, uh, bytes you know composing the file so we can see here that the dump command basically uh, if we execute it to the prompt then we get like um, um, bytes right so the contents of the file is starting since the beginning of the file now I say that poke is a binary editor so you can expect that you can actually um, uh, well edit the stuff stuff with it right and uh, um, the most basic entities that you can edit with poke are bytes right so for example we can say okay um which one is the byte at the uh, starting at the first byte since the beginning of the file and then well we'll get it like that right um but then we could also modify it 
right? Because imagine that uh, we want to, I don't know, to vandalize this cell file so it's not recognized as an L file anymore. So we could do something like this. We could break the magic number in this case. So we could say, okay, change the first byte, you know, to, um, uh, well, the ASCII code corresponding to the little x, uh, lowercase x uh, character. So then if we dump again, well, you can see, well, I don't know, can you see my my the cursor in, my, in the screen? Yeah, I think so. You can see that it actually changed it, right? In the file that we are editing. So this is how you manipulate single bytes here. Um, okay, let's restore the file. So this was uh, the big E. So now, this is back, you know, like a normal uh, L file. Okay, but in the same way that you can manipulate bytes this way, you can manipulate other, or manipulate other kind of simple data, right? So, for example, you could say, okay, uh, I want to write or give me, I want to read or I want to take a look to the string, right, starting at the beginning of the file. And then we get a string, which is uh, basically, well, in this case, it contains the elf, right, which is the magic number, which happens to be, you know, readable Lasky. Um, in the same way, we can do something like this. So the string is starting at the first byte. I want to change it to, instead of elf, to FLE, for example, you know, to reverse it. And it also works. Oops. Um, in the same way that we can do that with bytes and with the strings we have seen, we can do it with integers, um, but, you know, no, no, normally in programming languages you have integers, uh, you have types covering certain widths of integers, right? Both signed or unsigned. Um, like 32 bits integers, like 64 bits integers, and so on. But POKE um, is different in the sense that in POKE 32 bit integers, for example, they are nothing special. You can have integers of any number of bits from one bit to 64 bits. And this 64 bits limit is something that we are gonna remove soon when we integrate and support for big numbers. So what I mean with this, we will see a bit more about this later when we see weird numbers, is that in POC, in reality, um, an integer can be an integer of 11 bits. So for example, give me the integer, uh, the 11 bits, uh, and sign integer starting an offset one byte, for example. There you go. Well, it is that value in hexadecimal, right? Um, we will see later too, a bit more in tip, that those integers, they don't even have to be aligned, right? I mean, you could actually ask for uh, the unsigned integer of 11 bits starting at offset 13 bits, not 13 bytes, and you get that value as well. And, um, well, this is basically pretty generic. Again, there is nothing special about the conventionally sized integers anymore. We will see later that for, for this to work and to be predictable, of course, we need some kind of, um, of abstraction, right? Because as we will see later, well, underneath what we have is a sequence of bytes. So when we start talking about odd, odd numbers, like of 11 bits and odd uh, alignments, then we, have, we need to have some kind of con conventions, right? We will see that later. Anyway, um, in the same way that we can work with uh, integers, with the strings, you know, the, uh, we can also work with arrays of things. Like, for example, um, give me the array of three 11-bit integers starting at offset 13 bits in the file. Well, those are the ones. Um, those are the ones, actually. I mean, this works. <laughs> um, um, as we can also uh, do, as we will see also later, more sophisticated stuff. But to finish with the introduction, um, so this was an array, fine. You can also define structs. So you can also define your own data structures. So for example, let's see, this is the example I always use. Let's say that uh, we say that a packet is an integer, uh, I followed by a long L. Um, in POC, Things like uh, int is 
uh, synonymous of an infected tool, and long is an alias for I think well for int64. You can use either. You know, it is in a in a standard in the standard library that poke loads at, uh, at the standard. Well, anyway, so once we have a packet defined, this type packet in this in this case, well, you can do the same that with the simple types. So you can say, okay, I want to see the packet starting at 13 bytes in this case from the beginning of the file. So that is it. Um, and then of course. You can also say, okay, um, let's see this bar. This is how you define a variable in POC. Okay, let's put this packet in a variable P. And then, well, well, that's what we have. So imagine that we want to change one of the fields. So, well, we just do it using dot notation. So let's say that, for example, we want to um, increase, you know, the, the field L in one. And then now, if we take a look, to the contents of the file, we will see that these the contents in the file they changed accordingly. So we can do it, for example, to dump the dump command. We can pass arguments. So uh, we can say, how can we see the bytes corresponding specifically to this uh, to this packet? This packet at 13 bytes since the beginning of the file. Well, we will do it something like, okay, dump from from what? From the offset of p. This is how you specify an offset in uh, of a POC value. In this case, the value is a struct value, so and it is mapped, so it has an offset. Uh, size, P size. Mm -hmm. So then this should give us P uh, bytes starting at offset D, which was the offset where we mapped, 13, yeah, 13 bytes, and those are the bytes. And then if we look, uh, 01F7, 01F7, yeah. So the contents changed in the file. So let's restore the file again, minus one. And, uh, and uh, well, and that is how you actually uh, change, modify things in terms of your abstractions. Now, this is a very a small, stupid example, but we can do a bit better. So, for example, we say that uh, foo.o, it is an L file, right? Dump. Oh, dump from zero bytes. The dump command remembers the last offset that you used, right? So, so yeah, this looks like an L file, right? We see the magic number there and everything. Um, so, we can say, okay, we are editing an L file. So, it happens, and let me change an Emacs here that we spoke we distribute a set of what we call pickles, which are basically a collection of uh, pre-written definitions for some certain formats or domains <coughs> or <coughs> whatever. In this case, there is an elf pickle, which is this one here, and uh, it contains definitions for uh, well many different things. I already showed this last year, but now, obviously, now we support methods, now we support much more things, so the PKL accordingly is much more sophisticated now and much more useful. So, um, for example, well, basically, something that it's always defining PKLs or more often is uh, types. So, for example, here we can see a type, which is the type corresponding to an ELF64 ELF file. So this struct definition, basically, it covers everything that uh, uh, corresponds to the ELF file. We will see that why having, you know, this type called a file and, well, um, imagine that you had different ELF files packed consecutively in a stream, for example, or in another file, or in a tar file, or, you know, um, you could still, with POC, you could still map an ELF64 file uh, in this case, type from any offset in the IO space. So it doesn't have to correspond to a physical file. So anyway, um, in this case, full um, uh, well, it is an L file. Actually, POC knows that. And it, it recognized that uh, this is an, an L file. That's why you can see this elf, little elf thing at the at the left of the of the prompt. So 
Why did it, it recognize it? Because in my pocket RC file, uh, no, it's not in the poker RC file, sorry. Um, std lip poke well i can find it now but anyway there is a part in the poke runtime that basically associates it has an association list in an array with uh, file names to to specify what it is it's similar to the emacs association list we use it extensions to formats. Anyway, whatever. You know, divagate here because we don't have time. Anyway, so um, basically this means that uh, uh, I have access to all that stuff that is defined in the elf pickle. So for example, the types, uh, you can see that we have auto completion now. Um, so for example, I would, I would want to see, well, what is the L file, the contents of the L file? So I map an L file at the beginning of the file. In this case, offset zero since the beginning, right? Well, and this is what I get. Um, as you can see, there is an L header, um, and then there is all the rest of the fields under it. Okay, so um, it happens that, uh, well, I can do def bar L that. So now the, the variable elf contains this map struct. So for example, if I wanted to get the header, I would I could prefer to it to as elf um, the HDR, and then I get the header with all its, its content, the, all the contents. Um, right now we can do better things than this. So for example, I can low I can do okay very fast. For example, I can do a load. Well, for example, if I want the text section of the L file, I can call to a method that is defined also in the pickle, which is called get section by name. And then this is the um, 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 this is the contents of the, 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 text, the, the text section of the of the F file, which in this case this is a BPF file. We use be compiled using the BPF backend of GCC, so I can load the BPF pickle, and then now I have access to all those types. BPF. So, for example, I can say, okay, um, uh, give me all the BPF instructions. Uh, SH size that occupy asset size bytes at uh, text SH offset. There you go. And then you can see the different definitions of the BPF instructions here. We will see a little bit more of this later. Anyway, this is POC. So when you have a value that is mapped, that is mapped, you can actually edit it. And when you modify the, the structures, it gets updated in, in the file. In this, in this case. So let's go back to the presentation. Okay, the architecture of POC, this very fast. Um, POC is not as simple as it should, it, it could seem. Um, actually, it has a compiler, it has a virtual machine, uh, it has an IO subsystem, which is the one that is in charge of implementing, you know, all the, well, on the input output in this case to files, but we will see that it, we support other IO spaces. And then uh, all of that is in a lead poke. So .g, as you can see, I listen sometimes, not often, but sometimes I do. And uh, now there is a lead poke that provides services. We will see this later too, very fast. And the poke application, the command part. Okay, this is uh, this was to not confuse. Uh, POC is the program. POC with big P is the domain-specific language that uh, POC implements. And then a pickle, as we just say, this is a collection of related uh, facilities, right? Okay, those slides I got them here just in case. 
for you know but this is what we have seen now you know it's okay it has uh, it supports integers it supports uh, arrays structs and so on i don't know why it's taking so long for the slides to load actually type structs it supports variables as well and uh, functions Okay, let's go to the interesting part. What is new? Um, let's just start with the um, fun stuff. Um, using Bruno Heibel's uh, lip text style, which is something that he wrote recently, um, now we, as you, as you have seen in, in the demo, now we support uh, like a styling in the terminal. So that means colors, nice, that means, uh, uh, well, uh, bold and things like that, like attributes, visual attributes. For the output this um, is implemented as basically everything that bruno writes in a very uh, convenient way in a in a way that uh, basically you define the style using a css file like this this is the file that gets installed by default in package in the package tier um, where you can define uh, classes like a styling classes and then um, well pop will basically do the right thing in the styling this is also so for example if you if we print the number 13 you can see it there you see it's green and it is green because there is an integer class here defined here where the color is green but you can also define your own your own classes and uh, the classes that you can, how you define your own classes? Well, let's define here um, a full class, color pink. And then from poke, you can you have a primitive, which is printf, which surprise, it does formatted output. And there is, uh, this is the syntax that you use, for example, I want to print something with a class, uh, uh, with a class foo. So in this case, for example, let's print uh, uh, an integer in decimal using this styling class, 13. Oops, here we go. Oh, yeah, OK. I, I don't know how to use my own programs. That's always happens to me. OK, this is the format, right? So this basically prints whatever is in the middle with using that styling class. I forgot the new line. 13. Oh, I have to restart pop. Yeah, of course, because it means there. Uh, no problem. There you go, pink. So, this, that is nice, you know, to have uh, like, uh, like nice colors and, you know, and to see stuff. It has another advantage which is the support for terminal hyperlinks. Which I will show you now how, how they feel. I took great pains to, to compile a GNOME terminal, which is modern enough to, uh, you know, to support this, but I think it's worth enough because it's very interesting. Well, what are the hyperlinks? You know that the terminal emulators for a long time now, they sort of support, you know, they try to recognize HTTP links and FTP links, you know, like URLs in the output of the programs, and then they do the right thing somehow. You click on them, and then it opens a web browser or whatever it is. But um, some smart people, they thought that this could be improved, and they basically created those terminal hyperlinks, which basically is uh, an escape sequence. Um, um, it's a terminal escape sequence that you escape first, and then you specify the URL, you specify the description, and uh, and so on. And then it's up to the terminal implementations to do the right thing, to recognize them, and to, um, uh, well, to open a web browser or whatever. Now, based on this, in one of the Rabbit Heart meetings that we have sometimes, um, we basically um, added support to POKE to use the hyperlink support 
to uh, establish a communication with the user through links on the terminal. How does this work? So, now we have POC running here. Let me quick, quick, quick share again. Um, there are, we support for now two different kind of terminal hyperlinks in POC, two kind of command. The insert command and an edit command. Um, you know, in POC, you can have different files. Like, for example, you can open the file foo, and let's open uh, my etc password file, because why not? So, at, at this point, as you can see here, at this point, we have I have three different IO spaces open in POC. The etc password file, the foo.o file, and then a memory IO space called foo. And look that those are links, right? So in POC, in order to switch to a different IO space, you use the IOS command. And then in this case, if I wanted to switch to the file foo.o, I would write something like this, not IOS uh, one. One is the ID of the IOS space. And then it POC tells me that the new, the current IOS space is this new one. But using the hyperlinks, you can just click on those uh, names in this case. So, for example, now the current file is etc password, now it is foo.o, and now it is the buffer. It is the memory I use foo. So, this is an example of an edit, um, uh, an execute command. If you look at the URL, well, that's, that's too small for us to see, but I think it's in this slide. You will see that basically it is communicating with POC using um, a socket, a TCP IP socket, using a protocol that we designed in this meeting that we referred before. But you also have other kind of hyperlinks in POP, which is that they insert ones. So, for example, you can see, you can say two plus, and then you select, uh, in this case, this size, this offset here, and then you see it inserts it in the um, in the prompt. And it's done the right way. So, for example, if in between, when you have something in the prompt, in the read lane buffer, you select, you execute any of the other commands, you don't lose your input in the prompt. So, oh, well, yeah, of course, I should add two different offices. So those are the hyperlinks. Um, we are sort of excited about them because we really think that this, this they could be used, you know, to actually bring the, the command line to, okay, I know this sounds like bullshit, but to a different level, to a new level. Because you don't need courses in this case to um, to achieve interaction, right? Uh, you know that kind of interaction. So you print, you can print your buttons, you can print your menus, and you can print your stuff. Actually, if you look at the slide, I am considering adding here a sort of a, of a toolbar that will be displayed on top of the prompt and also the user can will be able to customize it and to associate poke, poke functions and commands written in poke uh, to those buttons basically i think this is worth the looking forward also for the other GNU tools i'm thinking maybe a particularly in gdb thing that would be a good context um, so those are the hyperlinks exciting things what else is new Union types. Union types now work. Uh, last seven months ago, they were not working yet. Now they work. Um, well, you know, in POC unions uh, are the way, I'm not going to get into that because we have no time, um, are the way to basically um, um, conditionally decode the stuff, right? They could look like a bit counterintuitive at first, but um, when you get used to them, they are nice, right? Uh, they are based on constraints of fields. I refer you to the talk from last year, you know, to for more information about how units work. What else is new and exciting? Oh, initial values for, for struct fields. Um, basically, when you define a struct uh, type, you can use constraints, right? Um, so, for example, sharing again. For example, you could say, okay, in my 
packet, the stupid, silly, usual example, that is one integer and then uh, long, um, basically there is a restriction, which is that the integer it should be bigger than the long. Well, this doesn't make any sense. Okay, let's let's make it that it's, uh, no, no, you cannot do that because long is defined. Okay, let's do it the other way. That the long, it should be bigger than, um, than the previous field, that the integer, right? Okay. Um, you specify constraints like this, like with a colon and then an expression. So, um, um, but but sometimes, well, how is this used? Well, if you try, hey, this, I don't know, are we going to be lucky? No. Well, yeah, of course, this is a very silly, well, imagine that this will, this will not be the case. Let's do it, uh, for example, uh, This is no, uh, iOS 2. Yeah, this is all zeros. So if we try to pack this packet here, yeah, now we do. Then we get the constant violation exception. But sometimes the default value, sorry, sometimes the constraint can be used also to specify what will be the default value for that field. Because we will see later that we support the struct constructors now. So when you want to do that, in order to do that, basically you can use this syntax. So long L equal to I in this case, for example. This is not exactly equivalent to the one before, but okay, let's define packet number two. Um, the constraint is the same. But, I mean, this is the equivalence of having the constraint and also when you construct a packet, it basically it will use it will use it to, to build, you know, the full value of the field. This is it. I'm sorry if it's not very clear, but we have no time. This is useful, for example, uh, to define magic numbers and creating new, new, new data. Um, now we support optional fields. Um, as you can see here, this is an excerpt of the L64 file. If you are familiar with L files, I guess that most of you are, you, you know that uh, an L file can contain sections or and um, a program here, segments, right? Sections and segments. Um, how many sections and how many segments you have in the file, this comes from information which is stored in the header, right? In this case, this ESHNAM and EAPHNAM for sections and segments, respectively. Also, if there are no segments, for example, um, there is no program header table. So this is how you express this in poke. You write at the end of the field definition if whatever um, whatever expression. I will show it but to you in the demo, but uh, we have no time. So basically, this means that some of the fields in the strategy may be absent, and Pog does the right thing basically with this. What else is new? Well, strut constructors. Up to now, we have been working with struct values that we have mapped, you know, in a file or whatever IO space, right? But, uh, okay, let me go back to the second, to the example, the type packet. Oh, not the type packet, that's boring. Elf, for example. So, for example, an L64 header, okay, we map it at some offset in the IO space. But now, poke is able to actually create new extract values which are not mapped in an IO space to, to construct them. So, basically, this is, this is how you will construct a new fresh elf header that is not mapped in the IO space with this syntax. Now, when you create a new structure, then you can specify initial values for fields. Like, for example, uh, the E type for this is going to be 12. And the E type is 0C, right? So it works. When you construct a struct uh, using a constructor, Basically, the same, I mean, the process is very, very similar to what happens when you map a struct. 
And in particular, the data, the data integrity that you define in your, in, your, in your data type, it applies too. So for example, if we try to create uh, an L64, okay, let's use, because otherwise it's gonna be complex. For example, we define our packet, and I should be uh, bigger than 10. So, if we create a new packet using a, uh, the simple constructor, it fails. Why? Because when you use a constructor and you don't specify an initial value, then it uses zero in a smart way, you know, depending if it's an array, it uses an array of zeros and so on. And in this case, zero is not bigger than 10. So, the constructor, sorry, the, 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 the constraint expression is failing. So, we get the constant violation exception. What can we do? Well, we can provide an initial value for uh, that field. So now we are creating a packet in which i is bigger than 10. So the constraint, the constraint is not failing now. So those are construction constructors. It happens that, for example, exceptions are now implemented in POC as, um, as, uh, as structs. And when you want to write in POC an exception, well, you basically do it with something similar to this. So those that is for extract constructors. What else is new? Um, now it is possible to define types, variables, and functions. So to have definitions um, inside the struct types. And they live in their own lexical scope, of course. So, for example, consider this example. This is a packet that has uh, a magic number, uh, which is the first byte, which here you see one of the initial values we were talking before. Then it has another byte, which is the size of the packet. But it's not really the size of the packet. You see? I mean, it's not, sorry, it's not really the size of the data. It is some encoding of the size of the data. And in this case, it happens that if the size is uh, FF, then it is to be considered as zero. So there are two ways of basically expressing zero in this encoding for the size. So then uh, we have an array of the payload, which is the data, and then an array of control, which are CRCs or whatever. But how big are those arrays? Well, we cannot use size directly because we have to do this conversion of the encoding here. So in order to avoid writing this expression twice in this case, well, we can define a variable here with the real size and use it, which is convenient. Um, you also can uh, embed uh, things like functions inside uh, inside types. Like for example, in this case, there is a library function in this, let's imagine, called calculate CRC. Um, but this function is implemented in a way in some pickle, in a way that um, it can result in a division by zero. But for the initial value of this uh, of this field in this in this struct type, we don't want that. What we want is that if there is a division by zero in, in the internal calculate CRC function, we want the value this to contain zero. And this is how we can do it as well. We could have used a dev, a dev bar here as well, but because the function doesn't get any argument, but this was just for purpose of showing it. So this is useful. Um, but you, we cannot. It's not only that we can embed uh, like that, like variable definitions and function definitions. We can also embed another type definitions. So this is a classical, well, classical. Yeah, this is new, but it's classical already. This is the classical example here. So this is a BTF type, um, which you have a name here. You have some information here, and then you have the data which is specific to depending on the type of the kind of the type that it is describing so then you have uh, btf integer array enumeration function prototype variable member and so on um in this case the btf function protocol you know which is one of the options here in this union uh, the definitions the definition of the parameters is obtained uh, the number of parameters for this function prototype, you get it from info, which is a field that comes before in the extract type. 
So we are generating, we are defining this type here, embedded here, so we can use it below. And this is this has access to the lexical environment uh, of the previous field when you map or construct an extract of this type. Um, this is gonna be not that useful in because we are going to implement passing arguments to the to the types very soon, but it's still handy. So yeah, you can embed types in other types. Um, what is new? Methods. Now we have proper working methods in structs. The methods are, well, I mean, we need it. We totally need them. Uh, basically, they are not functions. They are like functions. They totally look like functions, actually, but they are methods. Um, the methods are defined in, two, in the types. And for example, those are two functions which are from the elf pickle, right? And you can see how they are used to uh, to do different things. In this case, this get a string it uses it locates the string table in the elf file, um, and then it uses the offset that you pass along with uh, the information from the section header table to give you an ASCII an null terminated ASCII string, uh, given its offset in the string table of the file. Um, the methods they get an implicit first argument, which obviously is the struct the value the struct value uh, on which it is operating note that inside you can actually refer to the fields which are defined above without having to write a self dot or anything like that the compiler is smart enough to do the right thing and now that we have methods now we have pretty printers which are super nice um basically when it comes to binary data like this with this kind of stuff, uh, more often than not, the stored representation of the data is not the most um, interesting one or the readable one. So it often happens that we are interested in something very particular, and uh, uh, but and for that we are interested in, we want as much detail as possible. Like if we want to 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 mess with um, I don't know with uh, dwarf uh, expressions in some uh, the back section in an L file, and we want uh, we want to be able to manipulate the dwarf stuff in a very detailed way. But everything else is something that we want to have like in a readable way, right? More than the little bits of it. So the pretty printers they provide uh, a way to do this. So let's see an example. Yeah. So now we are in our elf elf file again, and let's get the text section again. section by name text let's get the BPF okay load BPF let's get the BPF instructions array again text SH size at text SH offset say instructions so we have okay let me put the output base to decimal we have nine instructions, the BPF instructions. Let's take a look to the first one. There you go. So, um, well, basically, there you can be the you can see the pretty, the pretty printers. If you see everything that is printed between um, dash less than and bigger than, is pretty printed. It's by convention. This this notation is by convention, and I am abusing the the least traditional way of notating things that don't have a textual representation, right? Like closures and everything, and the like. Um, so in this case, for example, there is something here which is a BPF instruction opcode that it happens to be an LDD double view instruction. Uh, but obviously, this is not what it is stored, right? Like in the binary file, but it is pretty printed. So. Let's see, let's take a look to the pretty printer responsible of this. So if we go to the pickles collection, we go to the BPF file, and when we look for, uh, this was uh, um, opcodes, right? Yeah, there you go. 
So basically, if you look at this definition here, it's an anonymous struct, which is part of the BPF instruction. And basically, the, what is this? This is a union of uh, uh, the op with the opcodes, because there are two kinds of BPF instructions, basically. Uh, some of them, oh no, I'm looking at the wrong place. This is for the immediate, the opcodes. This is the, is the definition for the opcodes. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, it is a union anyway, because the op the op it can be an, uh, an arithmetical logical unit jump instruction in which it uses uh, those three opcodes here, those three fields, or it can be a load and store instruction, which is a different class, class of instructions, in which case it has a mode, a size, and a class. The other one has a code, a, a source, and a class. And also there is a constraint here to make sure that the instruction is correct and everything. And look at the pretty printer. Basically, the pretty printer is, it, first it prints, it's a method with a special name underscore print, and then first it prints, uh, well, the convention that we have been talking about, and then it does the right thing. Note, by the way, how it is using a styling class which is called in instruction mnemonic that we have in our CSS file. So if other pickles or in POC wants to print instruction mnemonics, like if we make a disassembler infrastructure, then every all the mnemonics will be printed and styled in, in, in the same way. So those are pretty printers. What else is new? Okay, this is more about more on pretty printers. Oh, here you can see how there is an option in POC, which is uh, the pretty print option. But if you set it to yes, you get everything pretty printed. If you set it to no, then you don't get it pretty printed. So you see, here you can see that the opcode, now you can see all the gory details of it, right? Okay, fast, fast. Okay, well, now we support memory IO spaces that basically you can create uh, on the fly, cheap, fast, um, 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 IO spaces, you know, for like temporal stuff. I will maybe later show something about that. Um, Eric Blake contributed um, an IO space handler uh, backend for this uh, network block device. Well, I don't know. Is this this way of uh, of uh, of basically exporting a disk over the internet? And in POC now you can basically use uh, things like this. Uh, to edit directly, to poke directly MBD devices. Okay, um, very fast. I'm sorry that this, this because this part is a bit tricky. We saw before that we, that poke supports not only 32 bits integers or 64 or 8 bit or 8 bits or whatever, but you, you have like all sort of weird, crazy stuff here, right? Like 11 bits integers and whatnot. Um, so basically, um, so basically, uh, how is that done? Well, underneath you have an IO device, which could be a file, could be a memory buffer, whatever. But in the IO device, what you are editing is a sequence of bytes, because we all know here that basically all these bits thing is 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 I mean, it's it's not real, right? I mean, it may be real, maybe not. I mean, it's an abstraction, it's a construction, right? Because uh, it, it, at this level in the operating system, a byte is a byte, it's a number, it's a little number. So what POC does is that on top of the stream of bytes, it basically abstracts up and provides a stream of bits. And on top of the, the stream of bits, it basically provides you with the POC values. Like in this case, this is an integer of 16 bits, starting at two bits. Now, in POC, we take it very seriously, the weepy weak philosophy, which is what you POC is what you get. It's not like C, it's not like, you know, well, it depends what you're compiling for, the physical layout will be different. No, in POC, the idea is that it's always the same given an endianess and, and negative encoding, basically. So, um, so, we have support for weird integers. There are two main types of weird integers. The integers that span for more than one byte, but they don't fully use uh, part of the second byte by convention in this case um, and this is how it works i'm sorry i have to run now there is no time um, the other kind of weird integers is what i call quantum bytemics which is when you are using like sub byte 
uh, uh, integers, right? So, for example, an unsigned integer of five by, of five bits. So this is how it works. In this case, obviously, the NDNS is is not well, not obviously. But yeah, by convention, the NDNS is not impacting this, not affecting this. So, um, when you have an aligned integers, this is what it how it it happens. You have the bytes, you have the bits, and then you construct on top of the bits mentally. You construct those virtual bytes, which are the ones on top of which you have the poke values. So it may look like tricky, but really, even I can do that. I mean, uh, once you understand how the NDNS impacts and the two kinds of weird integers, basically using this model, you can actually predict uh, in your brain, basically, uh, what will be the effect of mapping a 16 bits integer displaced by two bits. Hmm? Okay, it's a pity we don't have time. Integral structs, okay. Uh, for the base case, you have like a C struct like this that translates directly into a, a poke struct with three fields. Okay, fine. This is trivial. But um, sometimes composite data is encoded into data that it's itself stored as integral values. Like, for example, the, well, the typical ELF uh, uh, stuff that you all should be familiar with it, right? In this case, this, this field is the 16, the 32 bits, more significant bits, and this is the least, less significant field. In C, this is always handled like using bit masks and using macros like this. We could do the same in poke, uh, like using functions to mimic the C style, but that would be idiotic to do so, because then we will be using C, basically. So instead of that, in POKE, you can declare, you can tell POKE that a given struct is an integral struct, meaning that, yes, it has fields, it has, it has constraints, it can have, you know, everything that you can have in a normal struct, but when it comes to store that in disk or to pick or to POKE it, POKE knows that this is an integral, so it knows it does the right thing, according to the current NDNS and so on. Also, you can basically manipulate struct, uh, integral struct values, like if they were integers, like using an explicit cast or automatically, you know, uh, which is quite handy. It's very handy. Okay. Go on. Yeah, the loading pickers is also relatively new. You have seen me um, when I say load BPF or load ELF. Basically, it's a language level construction that loads whatever pickle is named after that. There are two different variants. Uh, in case it has a strange character. And then, what else is new? Poke scripts. Now we can write binary utilities in Poke instead of C, for example. So um, mm, we are using this, this Shivan trick. Uh, it's the same trick that Gail uses. I, I basically uh, uh, use the same strategy there. And basically, you can write Poke scripts that, um, um, well, they can access the, the, the environment and everything. And you can write binary utilities. I want to show you one utility that I have written, which is very stupid, but it's an elf extractor. This is it. So if you can see, you can see here the elf extractor is the Chibang, then the comment, the license, whatever. Then first it loads a pickle, which is the elf pickle, right? So it has access to all the definitions and everything. Then it checks for arguments that you pass the right number of arguments. And this is it. This is the code of it. Um, it opens the file that you specify the name of it. It maps an ELF64 file in, uh, in the file that you specify. And then it iterates in through all the section headers. Then it gets, look, this is using the method for getting the for getting the st a string from the L file that we saw before, and then it compares, and then it does the right thing. It extracts the section matching uh, uh, the argument that you pass to the script. Let's see it in action very briefly. Here we have a full then we call here F extractor uh, full of all. Uh, and if we don't pass a second argument, it will extract all the sections in the file. There you go. B 
PSFs, TextRel, blah, blah, blah. But the point here is that this is possible basically in, um, in 60 lines of book. Obviously, this is assuming that there is a ELF pickle um, implementing the ELF files and those methods and everything, but it is there, right? Because other people use it for other stuff. So, scripts, binary utilities. Now, as I mentioned before, POKE now is a, is a, um, um, is a library. Um, basically, um, which was really, it was so painful. Um, basically, the POC, it gives you all the facilities that you should need if you want to integrate POC in your program, in your utility. Um, and basically, it provides you the comp compilation services, uh, disassembler, management of IO spaces, including that your application can provide its own IO space implementation. Uh, it gives you auto, auto completion services in case your program has an interactive prompt or whatever. Um, you can load modules like programmatically as well, and you can manipulate uh, POC values also programmatically. You can build uh, integers, strings, uh, arrays, structs, and uh, whatnot, offsets. But also, we are adding now a machine interface. This machine interface basically is uh, is uh, is based on on JSON. Why on JSON? Well, because mm, those kids of today, you know, I mean, what can I say? If it's not JSON, they don't they don't eat it. So as JSON it is. So I'm not a big fan of JSON, but well, there are worse things. Um, basically, it is inspired a bit loosely in the the back adapter protocol from Microsoft. Um, when I say inspired, is that we use the same primitive, uh, you know, like requests, uh, answers, and whatever. But other than that, POC is not a debugger. So GDB would be nice to have an interface like this. Um, this is part of the Summer of Code 2020. And my good friend Costas, who is a champion, uh, he's, um, he's writing it as part of his student, a student, he's writing it. Um, this MIE machine interface, uh, well, basically, it's based on requests, responses to the requests and events. And, uh, um, well, it's the typical thing. Here you see an example of a dialogue. I would like to be able to show you the, the prototype uh, user GUI we, that we have now that is working progress to. But this is a typical dialogue exchange, right? R right now, POC uses uh, a pipe to, um, to, to implement this, this protocol and this this graphical user interface prototype is using the pipe interface, but it uses select. So, I mean, we can implement support for sockets anytime, you know, I and mean, so, and we can basically um, communicate this with uh, via TCP IP. Okay, there are some new commands. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have time to show you the new commands. Uh, of course, of course, and this I want to stress it, of course, um, in, Impoke the commands that we can impoke themselves. Not all of them, but most of them. And uh, for example, I don't know, um, now we have a copy command, which is a pity I can't show it to you, but uh, the copy command is written in poke, and this is it. So basically, this basically means that you can implement your own commands and use them, um, you know, I mean, with no problem. Um, the dump command is written in poke as well. Yeah? So there are a few of new commands which are handy. And what else? I don't know why it takes so much time to load the slides. Okay, we had a, a poke conference at Montreal in January this year. We were lucky because this was pre corona, at least around here. And we managed to meet. We did a lot of good work there, and we are looking forward to 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 meet again uh, if that gets possible at some at some time. So current status: fast, fast, and then finish, and I'm done. Okay, this as of today, um, we have like three thousand five hundred ninety-eight commits. Uh, now it's not only me. Uh, I mean, 
there are several people hacking poke. This is in order of appearance. Many thanks to all of you. Um, and we have a decent uh, test suite here. You know, at the moment, we have like more than 4,000 tests distributed in like in 10 different test suites. It's not enough, though, because there are still bugs. There is a still work to do after the first release that hopefully will come at the end of um, the summer. But they can't comment on them because I don't have time. And those are the project resources. So basically, there we have a homepage. We have a Savannah project where the Git repository is. We have a mailing list, obviously. We have um, a, a Baxilla. Thanks, Frank, for setting that for us. Um, in Sourceware, then we have also an IRC channel in Freenode. And I maintain a blog called Applied Pocology here that you may want to follow if you are interested in using POC. And, well, um, if you like the program and you, th you think it may be useful for you and you have some uh, cycles to spare, well, you will be welcome to hack with us. And, uh, and that was it. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. That was a, that was a very good presentation. Uh, lots of information, and it generated a lot of comments. I don't know if you had time to... Uh, so, yeah, so I'm, um, we got permission to stay a little bit longer if uh, you're available and other people want to stay and ask questions. We can take uh, a few minutes to do that. Yeah, yeah sure. We have Andrea, who's... Uh, Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi. I just have a couple of quick questions. So first, I wanted to ask if you have considered using an existing uh, programming language uh, instead of developing uh, a DSL from scratch, implementing it. And the second one is um, if you plan to bring all this stuff uh, within Emacs with uh, some kind of integration. Uh, to integrate it where? In Emacs, uh, as I see that you are yeah. an Emacs, uh, Emacs user. So. Yeah, of course, yeah, that's the most important thing. Yes. That's the most yes. important thing. Well, yeah, important thing. Have I considered using a pre existing programming language? I guess you are you have Lua or Python in mind, right? Something that is designed to embed in applications, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, only what you like. Well, I did consider that possibility, yes, but it was very fast abandoned because um, if, if you get into, into poke the language, you will see very fast that it's very unusual. It's not usual. I mean, it's weird. It's a weird language. Uh, it, not only because it has, you know, those types of uh, like uh, 11 bits or, you know, stuff like that. Also because, for example, um, one of the, of, the, of the most important aspects of the language is that we have united types for uh, not united types. We have um, uh, united values for the offsets. So in POC, uh, 23 bits is not 23. It's 23 bits. Um, I have I did not have time to show you know in detail. That is in the talk from the last year. If you're interested, there should be some videos there. Um, uh, 23 bits are not the same thing that 23 bytes, and 23 elf locations are not the same thing that 23 um, elf headers, for example, right? And I really wanted to be able to, to work with those um, concepts as a first-class citizens in the language, right? And for that, I needed a DSL. I mean, um, there is no way around it. I know if you ask the skin people, they will tell you, yeah, you can you can make it with the skin macros. Yeah, okay, fine. They, they, they can do that. But uh, yeah, I really needed a DSL. Now, Emacs, um, there is a POC mode to edit POC source files. Um, there is a start of it. Someone contributed it. I use the C mode for now. But yeah, yeah, I saw it, yeah. There is a RAS mode, which is for developers too. I have not shown it, but uh, um, part of POC is written in, it has its own macro assembler, and we have an assembler written in, 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 uh, in AWK called RAS. Um, and we also have a mode for that. And of course, um, I am going to write an Emacs, a poke.el that will use the machine interface, uh, well, to actually use poke from Emacs, yeah. So the people who likes 
graphical user interfaces, they can use a graphical user interface, and I will use the Emacs mode, right? For for editing pop, yeah. Not okay. for editing pop, for editing files. Okay. Well, I guess if you use Excel mode uh, and auto revert mode, probably you can still see what you are doing on the file directly in Emacs. Uh, mm, first, uh, will not be like that. Ah, because, because you don't write every time. Okay, I see. The IO, you do it in memory. That's what the, the, the what that's what the machine interface provides. Like it is going to provide also functions to ask for the status for the different IO spaces to get the bytes that has been updated or not. And, yeah, would be fun. Okay. Mm. I see. Thanks. Other questions? During uh, during your presentation, uh, some people started talking about uh, the dwarf pickle file, which is in future. It's in future, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, well, can you tell us a bit more about it? Mm, well, yeah, sure. I mean, um, everything that is in future, I just started writing all that stuff even before POC uh, existed, because since I had to define my own domain-specific language. I wanted to be very sure that I was not doing something very stupid, right? So first, I wanted to get the, the taste, right, and the, you know the taste of how will be the language I need to do what I want to do. Um, what we do is that as Poke gets more mature and more features gets in the language, uh, we move things from future, we rewrite them to modern Poke, to actually existing Poke, and we move them from future to pickles. So Mark, I guess, um, if I have to guess, probably it was Mark who made that comment. Um, he has two options. I mean, he, he can just sit and wait for time to fix the problem. So uh, eventually, they will Dorf.pk will go from future to pickles, or he can do it himself, which I think is the preferred option. Mm. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, something else also that uh, people were talking about was uh, using poke as a validation uh, tool mm -hmm. yeah so you don't really modify the object file but you still read into it and then you use uh, the poke language to uh, validate whether or not it matches any constraints and uh, oh, it's, it's, it's good for that yeah. i mean the problems we are having is are in the other front actually but in know because now we have to start thinking about how to work with invalid data which is quite challenging mm -hmm. Because right now, if the constraint fails, you don't get a mapped value. But we want to, to make that more flexible. So you, you should get a warning, but you should be able to tag every value, every mapped value, as um, strict or not strict in terms of that integrity. right? So you can mm -hmm. work with broken data, which is good for um, reverse engineering and other stuff. Yeah. Does anyone else want to ask questions? All right. Well, thank you, Jose, again, for your presentation, for your demo. Uh, that concludes today. So, uh, you know, see you guys all tomorrow. Ciao. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm. Bye, bye. Thank you, Joe. Bye. Bye.